Nigerians can't seem to catch a break. It's always, always, always something. And this weekend, it's been queues. Queues at filling stations across the nation due to fuel scarcity. And to be fair, it's nothing new because Nigeria and fuel scarcity is like this, five and six. And despite our history and situation, situationship with fuel scarcity, you would think Nigerians will learn how to queue properly. The rush, the disorderliness, and there's always a fight or squabble with someone screaming at the top of their lungs, do you know who I am? Okay, mind yourself. Come to think of it, I believe the ruling class has a, a file that is passed on from one administration uh, to the other to pass on the torture and tradition of sending Nigerians back to uh, the filling stations to queue at least every six months. And as Africans and Nigerians, we must stick to customs and traditions of our land. And I believe there's also a tradition or file that is passed from one administration to another and it's titled No Light. You don't believe me? Do you have lights? It's not generator, it isn't to watch me. But seriously, our relationships with fuse and uh, queues at filling, uh, filling stations and fuse scarcity goes way back so much that Nigerians born and unborn may have a modified or somewhat altered gene in us. And maybe, just maybe, each administration tests that gene to make sure it's not do dormant. I know what you're thinking. Judith, that's too much for now. Now, come on, now, you're going too far. All that fiction and science fic that you're reading is starting to go to your head. It can't be that diabolical. That to, and to that, I have to ask you, can't they? Why can't they be diabolical? Nothing about Nigeria and its myriad of issues are rocket science, but yet, here we are. What advancement can you point to that we have been, been able to achieve that we can boast of as the giant of Africa? Giant of Africa, oh, ja, you know what I mean. Nanja, no, they carry last. Maybe our population. That's why we can, you know, one of the South Africans on petty internet wars. But other than our population, our numbers, our sense of humor, and our cannon wit for bants and jests, and also winning any Ghana Nigeria debate, what do we have that we can boast of? I know you're going to say, Afrobeats, maybe Nollywood. Oh, okay, I, I give you. But I'm talking about infrastructure. What do we have? So, do you agree it is diabolical now? Do you agree with my theory? Do you still think it's fiction? Then ask yourself, how many times in the course of your life as a Nigerian living in Nigeria have you queued for fuel? How many hours in the days of your life as a Nigerian Leaving in Nigeria, have you spent either queuing for fuel or hunting for a filling station that sells fuel at a good price at that? Mazino, you want to give my questions a go? Uh, How many times have you queued? I don't answer such questions. Do you know who I am? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I've been queuing for fuel since I could drive. That will be, what, uh, 20 years, 25 years ago. Yes, I'm that old, white hair. I beg you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, uh, but, you know, when you think about it, I've also been queuing for a very long time. Oh. And believe me, so the question is, do you believe me now, Nigerians, viewers at home, my dear friend? Do you believe me? Anyway, do leave the queues right now and join us, my able co-host, Ms. Una Rapil, and yours truly, Judith TV, for this weekend's last installment of Breakfast Extra. Grab a seat. Let's get started. And you're welcome to the Sunday Dailies, but first, let me give my own welcome to Breakfast Extra. My name is Mazino Appeal, and of course, you already saw Judith from before. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about very interesting topics as we discuss the loss of jobs in the Nigerian port or maritime industry. And of course, plenty of talk about freedom of speech, especially when it comes to investigative journalism, as we cite the case of Finding PDOM. 
You'll get to hear about that one if you stick around till the end of the show. But Judith, what a monologue to start the show oh, with. Thank you, thank it. you, thank you, thank so you. So dramatic. You know, as Nigerians, now, don't we have to be? Just Do you know who I am? <laughs> Too dramatic. Do you know who I am? But seriously, there's never an argument you don't hear that phrase. Yes, now, come never. on now. And, and then at the village, okay, leave that place, I'll show you what you came here. <laughs> well, you know something? As much as you think that you're civil and everything, even you oh, say those oh, words. I find myself me. saying it in traffic. Goodness <laughs> me. <laughs> goodness me. I had this one incident when I were a ride hailing app, and this man, I paid him. It seemed there's a debit text message, mm -hmm. email alert, plus the fact that on my own account, the money it's has debited. been. Yeah. This guy kept saying, I didn't see him. When I just looked at him, I said, Okay, do you know who I am? <laughs> Small money, do you know who I am? I you know who I am. Like, you can't be parked in front of my house for 3,400 naira. Do you oh, know who wow. I am? Well, in any case, I'm sure you too are also guilty. But it's all good. So, let's start with the dailies this morning. And we're going to be starting from the Vanguard newspaper. If you don't mind, you can follow me. Let's go to the front pages of the Vanguard. Vanguard has this as its front page paper um, headline. Poor governance in Nigeria, fresh storm over constitutional road, uh, crossroads, 25 years controversy on a new constitution or amendment refused to die. Tinumbu, the Patriots, Yekasai, Agbakoba, others weigh in. Yeah, that's the group. They've been um, uh, proposing the new constitution and we had uh, one gentleman here with us last week, if you remember. Protest erupts in Sokoto over bandits' murder of Monarch. That was a very sad story. Mm. Um, and, of course, third coronation anniversary, why I gave Ishekiri Distinguished Sons Award, says Olu of Awari. At the top for the Sunday Vanguard, in reaction, Nigeria's intelligence chief resigns and abducted husband kidnappers, forced pregnant women to travel 334 kilometers to deliver ransom. Um, however, I do remember us having these discussions and ransom giving is illegal. But then what can you do when your family member is being held captive? The emotions, mm. oh, I can't imagine. Okay. Uh, NPAMD upbeat about new port managers. Uh, $100 billion creative ministry drive improving opportunities, says Masawa on page 29. It's a packed page for the Sunday Vanguard on the front page. If you want to see that yourself, grab a copy, I guess. Oh, um, yes, indeed. We move now from uh, Sunday Vanguard to the Sunday Independent as we pull up Ed, right there for you on the screen. There we go. The big one that comes at you, Rubadu comes under fire as bandits overwhelm security agencies. He is not man for the job, security experts. NIA, DG, Rafai, Abubakar resigns. Uh, security is everybody's business, says CDS Musa. They can find that story and more on page two. At the top there, flood disaster, thousands of victims displaced, helpless in Katsina. That story is on page five. Kauko seeks Ajayore's speedy trial over alleged terrorism financing. That story is on page 7. MPA's Don Shoho's uh, tasks new port managers on customer-friendly port operations. That story is also on page uh, 5 as well. At the bottom there, Atiku responds to Bode George's comments of, on him. Want to find out what he says? You can find that story on page 2 on the Sunday Independent. At the bottom there, local government autonomy. Uh, analyst tasks are uh, FG on mecha mechanism for ensuring accountability. Say anti-craft agencies, CSOs have roles to play. That story is on page three. Kogi governor uh, remains committed APC member state government. That story is on page three as well. And at the very bottom there, Anambra EPAC disowns APC to participate in local government election. That story is on page four. And that's all for the Saturday, Sunday Independent. Saturday. Now we move on to the Sunday Times. I'm going to pull that one up real quick. Sunday Times has uh, these as its front page headlines. Nigerians in captivity, how abducted citizens spend years as a sh uh, hostages as bandits wait endlessly for ransom. Do you remember the NYC uh, core members who were abducted? Um, I don't know if, uh, a, uh, what do you call it, uh, when they say you, you don't have to to do the program. I can't remember the word. Uh, uh, I can't remember what they've been told that they wouldn't have to run the program anymore because they spent a year in captivity. I don't know if that's, if that's compensation enough because after suffering through so much, I think Nigeria owes them much more. 
That's conversation for next weekend, I guess. Yeah. Troops neutralized 171 terrorists, arrest 302 others in one week. Congratulations, Nigeria. At the bottom, students mobilize against proposed 80,000 naira electricity fee in universities. I don't get that now. They're paying electricity fees? Well, I mean, how would they charge their phones? Yeah, but... Yeah, yeah that was me. I was playing devil's advocate. I would like to think... I, yeah, <laughs> let's keep going, yeah? I'd like to think I'm owed that. By yeah, the, you know, yeah I, but uh, yeah, charging is, am, I your, am I the owner of your phone? Yeah, TikTok got to work. <laughs> Existing NIA DG explains why he resigned. I know do again. And um, that's as much as we have. Oh, oh, there's this one. Skills for Nigerian youths at National Sewing Championship 2024. Now, that's what I like to hear when you help the youth by giving them incentives to help themselves. Doesn't sound right. You should help yourself regardless. <laughs> but <laughs> Nigeria's... I'm not pulling Do you know who we are? <laughs> <laughs> I'll All move right. away from the Sunday Times now to the very next uh, front page for us this Sunday morning. And as we pull it up there for you, that's a Sunday nation as we go all the way uh, to uh, uh, Kenya. The course of coalition st uh, stacks Riley's uh, Azimo's uh, page six. Education, government faces multiple crises as schools reopen for crucial exam period. A chaotic third term. Thousands of learners are expected. Oh, no, that the th chaotic third term. Yeah, thousands of learners. I expected to report back to school for third term from Tuesday amid a threat of a teacher strike and other challenges in the education sector. The education SCS, and that's Julius Migos, barely a month in office as he's played full at stories on page two, three, and four of Kenya's uh, Sunday Nation. And there's also inside ever expanding house, uh, state house plum jobs at stories on page 10. Ruto's new appointments add to the growing number of powerful executive positions. And you want to find out more on these and more, it's on the Sunday Nation. Mm. I think we missed out a couple of papers for uh, Nigeria. I want to take us back, if you don't mind, Judith. Um, let's go back to, um, come back to Nigeria here for the Sunday Tribune. We've got this headline here, Give us useful tips to tackle insecurity. CDS urges Nigerians. It's a very big argument, this when you're asking Nigerians to give you tips. We talked to our security expert yesterday and... One of the biggest, oh, this was two days ago during yeah. the news. One of the biggest issues is state policing. I'm beginning to become an advocate for state policing because I think that that's one where we can solve most of the issues. Um, most police people don't know exactly what it obtains in their environments or vicinities where they're posted to. Right. So that might just tackle that better. Security is everybody's business, should not be left to security agencies alone, he says. I agree, but however, Nigeria Intelligence Chief Abubakar resigns from Tinubu's government, cites personal family reasons. Um, yes, um, and then at the top for the Sunday Tribune, suspected gun runners with 30 locally made guns land in police net in Edo. Woman carrying 124 rounds of anti-aircraft ammunition arrested in Nasara. Anti-aircraft ammunition is not small ammunition. So, yeah, I'm trying to give this gravity here. And lastly, for the Sunday Tribune, our son was once attacked during religious riots. Parents of one of the freed medical students recounts kidnapped students undergoing medical evaluation. VC discloses. That's all we can take for the Sunday Tribune. Do we have another Nigerian uh, paper here? Um, yes, we do, Judith. Uh, that's it. It's the Punch. The Punch newspaper. It's for the Sunday Punch 2027. Tinubu woos North as loyalist to battle opposition. Shatima Gandaje to reach out to aggrieved Northerners, as stories on page three. Chief Magistrate under proof for jailing Ondo man without trial, stories on page four. Economic hardship forces patients out of treatment, turns dying souls to beggars. You can find that story on pages 16 and 17 of the Sunday Punch. Unpleasant childhood polygamous experience made me marry one wife. Well, thank God for you. 80-year-old <laughs> retiree. Ooh. That's true. 26. Sarcasm. Uh, there we go. <laughs> At the bottom there, uh, Lagos night food vendors defy styrofoam ban, insist alternatives unaffordable. I just use nylon bags. The story's on page 16 oh, and 17. Oh, no, Judith. I know no. it's a joke. You didn't know uh, it was a joke. Judith. <laughs> ah, <laughs> Which school did you go to? <laughs> now. Come on. They're looking for cheap alternatives. It's, it's use okay. nylon bags. And shock as lady flogs strip friends naked for sleeping with her boyfriend. 
Well, entertaining. Well, <laughs> entertaining read for a Sunday. Yeah, well, there you go. It's like a light like Sunday read for you. <laughs> That's there is on page seven at the bottom there. And IADG resigns, cites family reasons. On, That's on page six. At the very top, how security agents killed suspected kidnapper rescued 20 medical students. That's series on page three. And finally, why people call me controversial pastor Damina. A series on page 12. Well, it's a, it's a marketing strategy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, the pastors, the controversy, controversy and pastors. I uh, guess. Uh, they said controversy is the best, best selling. Yeah, we got ourselves in one a couple of weeks ago, didn't strategy. we? All righty. <laughs> Uh, that's, well, that's all we can take this yeah. morning. That's all we can take this morning. No, please. It's just a Sunday morning, a light Sunday morning for mm -hmm. you. But that's all of the front pages we can take on a Sunday. It's Sunday's edition uh, for Breakfast at Triple. Stick around. Coming up next is our first big story for you. Don't go anywhere. A recent report, the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, NNPC, has announced an impressive net profit of 3.3 trillion naira for the year 2023. Now, this disclosure was made as part of the company's audited financial statement, marking its notable achievement in the face of a challenging economic environment. The NNPC attributed this profit to several factors, including cost-cutting measures, increased operational e uh, efficiency, and strategic investments in key areas of the petroleum industry. The 2023 financial statement also highlights the company's efforts to bolster transparency and accountability with NNPC, emphasizing its commitment to adhering to international best practices. This declaration comes at a time when the oil and gas sector globally and within Nigeria has been grappling with fluctuations in oil prices, regulatory challenges or rather changes, and also operational challenges. The NNPC's profit announcement is likely to spark discussions on the sustainability of these gains and what the means, uh, what that means for Nigeria's broader economic landscape. Mm. And so, joining us today to shed more light in this development is Ayotunde Abiodu. He's an analyst at SBM Intelligence. And Ayotunde, you're welcome to the program. Thank welcome. You so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you Grand. for coming. So, Ayotunde, <clears throat> got plenty of gains here. We should be happy at these. Uh, new numbers and all the factors that have contributed to giving us this current condition. However, how sustainable is this? How long could it go on for and what might topple it? All right, thank you so much. So a good starting point is to point out that at the root of this increased earnings, there was no substantial increase in production output. So it's not sustainable. So what just played out is that the NNPC was able to derive gains due to the devaluation of the Naira. So in January 2023, we started with um, 433 naira to a dollar. And then by December 2023, in his book, we saw that that number has jumped to about 900 naira to a dollar. So as such, seeing that the trade deals play out in dollars, it's expected that there was going to be an increase in the naira value of revenue by the NNPC for the year 2023. Mm. Uh, the company also said that one of the things attributed to their gains was uh, cost cutting. Can you elaborate on what the strategies for this cost cutting might be? Uh, to be honest, there's no really uh, evidence to show any form of cost, cut, um, cost um, cutting by the entity. Rather, if you go to the report, there are a lot of issues about the corporate governance practices of the entity. And I will give three instances. First, we see that uh, in 2022, the entity had a donation of about 314 million. Then in 2023, we saw that number jump up to about 11.5 billion naira, which is over a 3,500% increase. Second instance, we saw the amount that was uh, allocated to top management officials jump from about 1.3 billion naira in 2022 to about 3 billion naira in 2023. And you also see um, the wage bill of the NMPC in the space of just one year jump by over 180%, from about 168 billion to over 486 billion. So this shows um, the reality that uh, the NMPC has been posturing itself as being cash trapped. But when you look at these books, <coughs> there are a lot of corporate governance issues. Why are we having those substantial increase in wage bill and the amount allocated to top management officials in the space of just one year? Mm. Mm. Well, many would say the economy. Yeah, but let's talk about some of the commitment that they uh, 
uh, attribute to these success. Um, 3.3 trillion naira, fantastic. And they also say they're committed to transparency. Uh, how true or how credible is this talk of transparency? Uh, is the NMPC really committed to having its book open and transparency? And is this sustainable in itself, if it is true? Uh, so on the issue of transparency, uh, we need to start with how timely these reports are. So first, in, for the financial year of 2022, the NMPC did not release that report until about January 2024. So in uh, the issue of transparency, the NMPC has not been so clear on how that transparency should play out. Um, for its financial year 2023, we are just seeing the report released in August 2024. So this did not really um, translate to transparency. Also, when you look through the financial statement, uh, the revenue component were not broken down. We did not see how much came from the NMPC arm of the entity or for the group arm of the entity or how much it got from um, the gas component of the entity. So in reality, we do not really see that um, transparency level yet. I have to ask about you know, the profits that, that, they, that they have made and the sustainability of it, but also looking at all of their, all of their activities for 2024, divesting uh, from uh, uh, Dangote refineries, as well as making, putting that investment that they have pulled out into CNG or the other initiative they're trying to make, plus hiring. Uh, we noticed that they put out a notice for hiring. Mm -hmm. All of these efforts that they are making, do you see it helping to boost revenue for 2024 at the end of this fiscal year? Or do you see it, you know, to hamper profits in the long term? Um, to be honest, these measures have the tendency to um, boost our <coughs> revenue and also show more transparency posture from the entity. But at the root of it is, is there the political will for these measures to translate to uh, positives? Hmm. And, and, and let me also ask about, you know, all of the NNPC, NNPCL and all of its other, you know, um, dealings that they have when it comes to the price of crude oil, you know, them regulating the market and also all the other things that are going there. As an analyst looking at the sector, what do they need to do differently giving, you know, from 2023 a report that could make it better, you know, in terms of that, that they are not or that they have overlooked and could make better? All right. Uh, so I'll just draw the, narr uh, the narrative to the current fuel statistics and crisis that we currently see play out all over the country. Uh, so at the root of this is that um, the NMPCL as it stands is the sole importer of refined products um, into the country. And that's because even though um, by virtue of the PIE 2021, the market, the sector was meant to be deregulated, but the FS crisis kind of um, drove out the private players from being able to partake. So at the immediate, uh, what the NMPCL should do is to try to see how um, they can solve this um, first scarcity problem. And marketers have been raising concerns for months now that um, the distribution channels being employed by the entity has a lot of bureaucracy in it. So at the immediate, they should solve that problem yet first. Mm. And so then revenue. And then do you see a more better mm -hmm. boosted revenue? Uh, to be honest, I, I think the NMPC will still be caught in this web because um, their narrative is, oh, they are not paying subsidy. And the narrative is based on the premise that oh, for a number of years now, they've not exchanged money with market stats to be able to import. Rather, what they claim to do now is to pay the shortfall um, differential between the importation cost and the selling price. That still translates to a subsidy. Mm -hmm. So uh, the fact that we still have this narrative, um, it shows that uh, in the long run, any form of increased revenues will not yield um, any positive to the um, overall Nigerian public. And that's because, uh, see what has played out recently, the 2.1 trillion naira that should have gone as dividends to the Federation account mm -hmm. is not going. And that's because they want to use it to offset some form of subsidy payments. Yeah. So in the long run, we don't see any positives on this okay. if the, um, in totality that subsidy regime is not taken out totally. So in the light of this profit, and I'm going to put it in quote because from everything that you said, it's seeming like as if it's a mirage. I don't know if, I, if, it, if it's okay to put it so. If there is indeed profit, how does that play out for the investors inside of the oil and gas uh, uh, industry? Is that going to help in any way? Is it going to become more profitable even for them as well? Um, uh, and then, of course, the common man as well. How does it reflect on our pockets as well? 
All right. So ideally, the increase in revenue should translate to more investment options for the country. But at the root of it, there are structural challenges, um, vandalism, uh, oil theft. So as such, the Nigerian uh, oil and gas sector is not of interest to major players right now. We're seeing them go into alternatives like Angola and Nigeria and the likes. So if we don't solve the structural problems, any form of increase in revenue will not translate to bringing more investment options to the country. Hmm. So and this, oh, go on. And also relating to your question as to how it benefits the Nigerian people. So ideally, if the um, final dividends had gone to the federation account, which would have been shared among the three tiers of government, so you could have expected some form of improvement in the referism of Nigerians when that money goes to the sub-national and the local level. But seeing that that's not playing out, so there's no positive for Nigerians. So with the profit, I'm sorry, Judith, you were go about ahead. to say something. Yeah, no, go ahead. But, so with the profit that has been made now, what do you suggest that the NNPC invest that money into? Infrastructure, refineries, how could it be better spent that it could reflect better for the common man, um, especially when it comes to the case of fuel scarcity and the price of petroleum products? All right, so my suggestion would be that that money be redeployed to invest in infrastructure. Let's get our refineries running. Let's be able to have refined products in our territory rather than um, relying solely on um, importation all the time. I think if that is done in the long run, Nigerians can feel the benefit of any form of increased uh, revenue. Uh, earlier on, um, when we were talking about the cost cutting that uh, the, the company attributed to their profit making, uh, you said corporate, the corporate issues, you yeah, know, corporate, corporate, governance, corporate issues. governance that they had. And, and, I, and it makes me wonder, with their corporate governance, do you think that they have the will to invest in our, in our infrastructure, in this case, the refineries? That's, that's a tricky one. Okay. Uh, so ideally, this should be, I mean, so the idea is the NMPCL is trying to become more commercial viable and as such, transparency should be at the root of the activities. So, uh, but they, there's a problem. I mean, we would have ideally expected them to invest that money in infrastructure, but seeing as there's a form of subsidy payment going on, it does not allow them to do that. Mm -hmm. Besides the, their lack of political will, what, what other, can you be specific in terms of what their corporate, uh, their corporate governance issues are? Um, so we're seeing um, drastic increase in like some expenditure expenses, uh, which in the space of one year does not speak so good of the entity. Um, so seeing wage bill jump up in the space of one year by about 106 percent, um, the management officials are getting more than 100 percent increase in how much is allocated to them. More than 100 percent increase. Yeah, yeah, within the space of one year. Within and the space of one year. Yeah. So those are the issues, and also when you factor in. Um, the nature of donations that happen in the space of one year, is, it brings a lot to um, question. 314 million naira in 2022, that jumped to about 11.3 billion naira in 2023, over 3,500 percent increase in mm -hmm. donations. And when you look through at um, who gets the bulk of that donation, 91 percent of that goes to the NMPC Foundation. So that does not really speak so, so well. And mm -hmm. now that they're they are putting out the vac vacancies to hire, it begs to ask the question, with an increase of uh, wages, that means we're going to see more by the end of this fiscal year. Most likely. I, I'm very curious about the influence of private um, um, entities in the oil and gas sector, like Dangote, for instance. Should they get, and I do hope that they get off uh, on, on, on their tracks, how would that influence the profit for perhaps maybe the following years after that? Does it affect the NNPC in any way, whether at advantage or at a disadvantage? Uh, so ideally, it should position them in, um, in a way to be able to like, improve their operation, uh, operational efficiencies. The NNPC so or the private investment? So for, from the starting point from the NNPC, okay. so I mean, with more increased revenue, they should be able to increase um, efficiency. And that efficiency should translate to the remainder of the sector. I mean, the ability to be able to help other private players. So now, going back to the first scarcity example, um, marketers are complaining of how the distribution channels are uh, clogged with bureaucracy problems. So as, uh, we expect that with more increased revenue by the NMPCL, they can channel resources to solving that, which will now um, boost out the chances for private players and in turn translate to more earnings for them. 
Mm. I've always been of the opinion that bureaucracy and their red tape has always been a very huge problem in the civil service and every government parasite or an entity. Sure. And I feel like it hinders a lot. If they, if they pose themselves or thought themselves to be revenue-making entity, that bureaucracy and red tape makes it difficult for them to, to even generate revenue. And it's also very off-putting for, for, for investors as well. I agree. Yeah, I think so. I really do. Well, I mean, finally, before we let you go, I, I have to ask about, you know, um, long term. You, so, you talked about the social projects and them channeling the, so, some of the revenue to the social projects. CSR, good or bad? I mean, it's, it's good. It's good. It's good, I mean. But the bulk of it, I mean, going it's to, like, it's going to like an insider company. I mean. It's an insider company? No, like, so NMPCL. In terms of donation, about 90% of that went to the foundation. So, I mean, there's a lot of like, uh, how do I put this? So, there's no much transparency in how that paid out. Mm -hmm. So, and seeing that there was a drastic increase. So, because the foundation has always existed. So, the foundation uh, was part of the bulk that got about 314 million in 2022. And now, having about 11 billion just to that foundation alone in the space of one year. I mean, it makes a lot. I mean, it's question it incites a lot of mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, okay. I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Andrew. you so much for having me. Very interesting and precise insight into the matter here. Um, we're looking forward to seeing perhaps maybe what the following years would be, and then maybe we'll bring you on again. We won't wait a whole year. Don't worry. We'll bring you on next <laughs> week. <laughs> Do stay tuned. Coming up next, we'll delve into a crucial discussion on freedom of speech and its implications in Nigeria. Stay with us, a very interesting one coming up. In a disturbing incident that raises serious concerns about freedom of expression and the rule of law in Nigeria, Isa Mukwa, a prominent student leader in Niger State, was detained on the orders of Governor Umar Bago's appointees. Mukwa's arrest followed a Facebook post in which he criticized the state government's policies. Now, this action sparked widespread outrage among students, civil society or civil rights groups and advocates of free speech who view the arrest as an alarming attempt to silence dissenting voices. The detention of Mukwa not only highlighted the growing trend of targeting individuals who speak out against those in power, but also it underscores the fragility of human rights protections in Nigeria. The incident has intensified the debate over the balance between the state authority and individual freedoms, with many questioning the legality of the arrest and its broader implications for civil liberties in the country. Now, to discuss this critical issue, we are joined today by Issa Mokwa, the student union leader at the center of this controversy, and also Dr. Ayodeji Ayobide, a legal practitioner with expertise in human rights law. You're welcome into the studio. And of course, Issa, you're also welcome. Thank you for joining us. So Issa, if you're there, um, we would like to get a representation. Thank you for oh, there you are, vocal representation. Good. Now, um, Issa, if you would please, first of all, give us an idea of how this started, what exactly your uh, post was on Facebook that started all of this. Let's get an, a, a good concept of what the situation was before the arrest. What triggered all of this? All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I think this is a medium to myself. from Niger State, a student of Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida University, that is where I graduated. Uh, I am a member of uh, NANS, National Association of Nigerian Students. As a matter of fact, I am the financial secretary of NANS Zone C, that is the North Central uh, student at the angle of NANS. Uh, it started when uh, we went for our convention. You know, uh, I was given a position at uh, NANS Unfortunately, or should I say fortunately, some of our leaders who took us for that convention from the angle of Ninja Axis, about 80% of them, I know, they were given an appointment by the governor of Ninja State. And uh, ever since then, I couldn't help but notice that uh, <clears throat> they don't want some of us, the upcoming cadres, 
that they have given position in the nuns to talk, you know, uh, uh, to talk against the ruling party. Whereas they have also forgotten that uh, I'm also an APC card carrying member. And I rooted for this same governor. But anything that will affect, you know, the constituency that I represent, uh, the student constituency that I represent, of course, I would have to speak out. Now, fast forward to the recent happenings when I spoke uh, about the, you know, 200,000 naira that the governor went and uh, give uh, the NYC uh, COP members that came to camp in uh, Ninja State here. So it wasn't an insult, it was just an opinion rather. You know, uh, in, it, it, it is in my Facebook, even though there, there have been, you know, uh, calls from different angles that I should delete the post. And I said, I am not going to delete it because it affects my constituency, the student constituency. Now, there have been recent issues in the school I graduated, that is IDB University. You know, uh, in a video I posted in one of my, uh, was it one of my handle in Facebook, where the vice chancellor said about four to 5,000 students will be, you know, dropping out of the institution due to, you know, financial crisis in the country currently. So it came at the time where the governor was given 200,000 Naira to COP members that came to serve, you know, that came to come for three weeks in Niger State. So I now air out my opinion that uh, instead of the governor, you know, given this 200,000 to this 1,500 and something uh, COP members that came to, you know, uh, camp in Niger State, I used myself as an example. I said I, I did my camp in uh, NYC camp in Kubwa there, Abuja. And uh, by the special grace of God, we were not given anything. You understand? So not talk of a state where we have issues of, uh, you know, retirees crying for, for, for their pension to be paid, where we have in, in a state's own university where we have students, you know, reasonable numbers of students that will be dropping out of the institution. So I now air out my opinion that I think it is, the governor should have channeled that resources to the state's own university, or perhaps, although he has given scholarship, he gave scholarship of about 500 million Naira. So I also made the enemy started from, from the uh, angle of the appointees. So all those things that I have been making from the angle of ship not being, you know, disposed the way they were supposed to dispose it, I, I, I didn't know I was creating, uh, you know, enmity from some of these our leaders, and okay. some of these our governors appointees. Not until when they sent me a voice note. One of them, the SSA, the coordinator of our uh, students to the governor of our uh, zone A. That is the zone that uh, my own zone. So he now sent a threatening message that uh, somebody should warn me that any time I am found around student struggle or any time they see me in the state capital, they are going to deal with me and I am going to regret why I posted all those things that I posted. And uh, I said, no problem. I would keep on, you know, representing the students that uh, I took about to represent. Mm -hmm. And not of, just of recent, fast forward to what happened, the, the post that triggered, you know, uh, them coming to attack me at my residence here in Labai. Uh, there is a program that is organized by the uh, SSA on student engagement to His Excellency, uh, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So that program, if you look at the theme, it is in my post there. If you look at the theme, it is all about, you know, a, a, a student leadership, you know, student union leadership. And uh, to our greater surprise, we have institutions in Niger State like the Federal Polytechnic, the FUT, IBB University, and some other institutions. Even though we know issues that has to do with student constituency, they, don't, they no longer involve us because they know we are going to speak the truth and we are going to represent our students. They took themselves, the government appointees, they took themselves to the program. So when they came back from the program, I now, you know, took it, I now took it to my uh, Facebook uh, wall that uh, I didn't insult, there was no insult. I said, uh, instead of they representing the student there, they knew that I am the zonal uh, 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 executive in Nantes State, and anything that has to do with students, that has to do with students because I am the only zonal representative from the states, I should be involved. But uh, the reason why they didn't involve me 
because of course they are seeing me uh, uh, as a threat as one who speaks the truth however bitter it is so i made the post the day i made the post i started receiving calls of threats that hope i know what i'm doing and hope i know these are government appointees this 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 and that then uh, one of them now called me that i should go and drop the post and i said i'm not going to drop the post the following day on friday they visited me at my uh, my resident in Lapai. They came after about 20 minutes when I came back from Mox. They came to my room. It was the JCC chairman that first entered. So when he entered, we we're having discussion that why am I making all these posts? I am uh, I am trying to sabotage their effort. The government that is putting uh, food in their table. I am you know talking about the government. I said I am not insulting the government. I am only, only trying to draw the attention of the government to some certain places. And I know the government in its own angle is doing his best. But it is some of you that are, you know, are sabotaging the effort of the government, some of the appointees. The next thing I saw was the former NANS uh, Senate president in person of Dombo, who is the coordinator of student uh, uh, matters to the governor in uh, Zone B. He barged into my room and he asked me to go out of the room that we need to talk. I said, leader, with all due respect, sir, you can sit down here so that we'll talk about this, anything you want to talk about. The next thing he did, he said, no, I said, okay, let's go. He said, no, he's not going out. I should go out. So I said, this is my room and I need to lock the room. He said, no, I should go out. And when I refused, the next thing he did, he dragged me forcefully. He held my, uh, my clothes. Right. He dragged me forcefully out of the room. Yes, and not knowing that there were people outside, the ones yes, they came with, you know, some of them were holding speech, some of yes, them were sir. holding jack, and yes, all these people are government appointees. Yes, sir. The next thing I, I, I the next person I saw was the Issa. All yeah. right, fantastic. Yeah. Um, so the reason why I'm quoting you, I think we have the, the fair gist of the story yes, of what happened and the post and the, the attacks after. Now we're going to go on a short break. When we come back after the break, we're going to discuss this from a legal standpoint and how you know you know the, assessing the legality of your arrest and what this means. Uh, for dissent uh, in Nigeria. We're going to a short break. Stay with us. You're watching Breakfast. You're watching Breakfast Extra. Before we continue with our conversation, it's time for us to bring you the breakfast headlines at this hour. I am Judith at TV. We begin in West Africa, Nigeria, where the Director General of the National Intelligence Agency, NIA, Ahmed Rafai Abubakar, has submitted his resignation to President Bola Tinubu after serving nearly seven years in the position. Abu Bakr, who was appointed by former President Muhammadu Buhari, confirmed the development while speaking to journalists. He stated that President Tinubu has accepted his resignation, describing the move as a routine procedure. He also expressed gratitude to the President for allowing him to serve for the first 15 months of the new administration, having occupied the office since 2018. And out to economy, as the Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Wale Edu, has said the current reforms of President Bola Tinubu's administration is reshaping the nation's economy. He spoke at the Nigerian Economic Summit Group National Economy uh, di uh, Dialogue in Abuja. Uh, Edu challenged members of the organized private sector to join the government in its efforts towards the diversification of the economy. The minister noted that the U.S. dollar domestic bond designed to attract Nigerian savings from abroad and also fuel domestic economic growth for the betterment of the economy is such an initiative. We'll move away from that now to judicial matters where the Social Democratic Party governorship candidate Murtala Ajaka in the November 11, 2023 governorship election in Kogi State has called on the Inspector General of Police, Kayade Egbetokun, and other relevant security agencies to investigate the vicious attack on him and his supporters by some thugs. Ajaka and his supporters were attacked at the Supreme Court in Abuja on Friday after the five-member panel of justices of the Apex Court in a judgment dismissed his appeal challenging the election victory of Usman Ododo of the All Progressives Congress for lacking in merit. 
The acting governor of Niger State, Yakubu Garba, has called on the federal government to urgently redeploy military forces to the Alawa uh, community in the Shiroro local government area of the state. Garba's appeal came in the wake of a fresh, devastating attack on Wednesday, where 13 farmers were brutally killed while working in their fields on the outskirts of the Alawa community. The attack has further worsened the insecurity in the region, leaving residents in fear for their lives and prompting many to flee to safer areas. And now to Igbo land, where new yams are regarded as blessings from God to mark the beginning of harvest season and end of the rains. Now, usually communities across the southeast region of Nigeria choose different dates within the months of August and September to celebrate the new yam annually. In this report, News Central's Chinwe Ugeli brings us some insights into this festival. Take a look. The most important and celebrated food crop in the entire Igbo land gained prominence from way back. Traditionally, the male folk is known to cultivate yams while the women concentrate on cassava and other smaller crops. This apparently made the crop become associated with patriarchy, though not consumed by only men. In the olden days, it was a man's pride to cultivate yams and own a barn, either in his compound or the community's barn. The New Yam Festival is as old as Igbo tradition and will always be celebrated by sons and daughters of the region. It is God, the Achi, that gives them the harvest. You know, um, yam is a very big thing in Igbo land, and that is why the Igbos all over celebrate yam festival. It is called Iriji across the region, and is still considered a taboo for one to eat a new yam when thanks have not been offered to Chi. Um, it is a culture. They have some rituals they perform before they start, you know, eating the yam. The Iriji festival involves display of the yam harvests, music, dance, and feasting in the villages. <laughs> Naturally, the new yams being celebrated are from the farms of locals. The quest for greener pastures has driven men out of the farms, leading to purchase of yams from the market by families for the festival. I feel pained to think I'm talking about Iriji. When nothing has happened, we no more have yam. However, some men like Ndubisi Onyema from Okoyi Beko is the reason the new yam can still be celebrated with dignity. The high cost of yams notwithstanding, some Igbos still patronize yam sellers during the festival. But I know as long as yam is food, you can get to the market, buy it, and make food available for you and your household. The traditional ruler of Ibeku ancient kingdom is a Samuel Onoha, says those who condemn the festival are ignorant of the essence. <laughs> As the people continue to enjoy the festival with their yams, it is hoped that more people will pick interest in cultivation of yams in the vast lands available in the region. In Omaha for New Central, Chinwe Ugele. Outer Health. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control says that it is increasing the number of laboratories to enhance its capabilities to detect cases of monkeypox to avoid it spreading in the country. 
And this was made known during a joint briefing with the World Health Organization to update stakeholders in Nigeria on the current situation with monkeypox and efforts to curtail its spread. Our correspondent Edong Joseph reports. Since the beginning of 2024, about 2,863 confirmed cases with 517 deaths caused by monkeypox have been reported across 13 African countries. This alarming increase is linked to a new strain of the virus which emerged in eastern Congo and has since been detected in Kenya, Rwanda and Uganda. With about 19 states in Nigeria including the Federal Capital Territory recording at least one confirmed case, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization has convened a meeting to brief stakeholders about the situation in Nigeria. Called in stakeholders, you know, stakeholder partners, including ambassadors from various countries, EU, Africa, even Japan. We're briefing them on this MPOC situation in Nigeria, our response activities in Nigeria, and the ability to rep brief on the African situation and what is happening in the world. With the number of confirmed cases in the country now about 40, the Director General of the NCDC says that there are efforts to increase screening centers for quick detection of cases to avoid further spread. All the cases we've seen so far were confirmed using genomic sequencing in two labs, uh, NRL National Resource Lab in Abuja here and in Lagos. But because of the spread, what is happening, we need to increase the number of laboratories we're going to use again to test. So we are increasing, we're including NIMA, we're including Luth, we're including SG, that's the, at, at the African Center for Genomics, I think in Ushubo, I think. Though Nigeria is not on the list of high-risk countries, the World Health Organization has emphasized the need to remain vigilant. With uh, cases reported as far as Europe uh, or Asia, uh, and uh, Nigeria is not, uh, uh, it's not safe until this overall uh, event uh, is safe. So we'll continue to work with the government. With the spread of monkeypox majorly through contacts with infected animals or humans, the agency has called for intensified efforts to sensitize citizens about the disease. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idong Joseph. And that's all at this hour for Breakfast Headlines. We'll bring you more at the top of the hour for 10 o'clock. We'll switch gears now to back to Breakfast Extra. And earlier inside the 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock hour, we're talking about a situation with a student uh, Isa uh, Mukwaz, who was uh, arrested and uh, his Facebook post has triggered uh, 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 intimidation as well. And joining us live in the studio is uh, Dr. Ayodeji Awobiide, and he's going to talk to us about the legal standpoint uh, of this uh, arrest. Doctor, welcome. We still have Isa with us. Uh, so talk to us about the implications here regarding the arrest uh, from a right angle. Um, was his right violated? Uh, and uh, any other implications that follow? Oh, thank you for having me. Um, Issa's rights were clearly violated. Uh, the arrest of a Facebook post, which basically is a challenge to his right to express himself. Uh, you would um, agree with me that our Constitution provides, in 39 of the Constitution, the right of citizens to express themselves. So Issa's right to freedom of expression was clearly violated and also his liberty was also violated. So uh, from the human rights standpoint, um, Issa is right within his rights constitutionally to challenge the violation of his rights by the governor and, uh, and his uh, governor and his aides, appointees. Uh, appointees of the governor, yes. And what this brings to the fore is that we have a lot of our leaders who think that they can act as emperors. And is that emperor syndrome that you see across all of these various actions of this manner where anybody in authority just feels that they can pick up any citizen, use the police to arrest them and lock them up for, throw the keys away. Uh, it still, from, it still, it still um, arises from that emperor mentality. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a democratic society, we're governed by laws, we're governed by rights, and this right is actually protected by the constitution. So you are free to express yourself, your opinion, on any subject whatsoever, within the limits of the law. Because of course there are, there are, there are limits. I've read the post by Issa, 
uh, there's nothing in there that warrants um, uh, any arrest or any violation of anybody's rights. So his own right being violated by the aides of the governor clearly, clearly infringes on that constitutionally guaranteed right. And of course, he's within his rights to find a way to enforce it and get some damages. To, so, to, to be more specific, what are some of those constitutional? Uh, what are some of the, what are what constitutional breaches did they commit? Yes, uh, those are the governors, uh, governors appointees slash aides. Okay, so um, straight off, I think three things. First and foremost, it was a violation of his right to freedom of expression. Secondly, the his right to dignity of human person. His dignity was violated because from his narration, it was they came into his home basically to harass him and then dragged him away. And also his movement was, was restricted for the period of his arrest. So you have about three different rights that he can go under and uh, seek um, uh, damages against the government for, and if the, the aids for. If you were to seek legal route through this uh, and address this, what, what, would be, uh, what would be the right thing to do in terms of for the, those who's breached the constitutional rights, what would be their punishment and what is his option uh, Isa Mukwa, what's Isa Mukwa's option? Okay, so the Constitution also provides for how you can enforce this right, and that you will find in Section 46 of the Constitution, and how you can go about enforcing it. So you can approach the High Court in the Niger State, or the Federal High Court in Niger State, to seek redress against the persons who violated this right. So that would be the aides, also maybe the uh, police officers involved, because ordinarily the police are supposed to protect the rights of citizens. Mm -hmm. So even, even if somebody tells you, oh, somebody has done this, at the police officer, your duty is to first and foremost listen to what the allegations mm -hmm. are. You make a decision whether or not that, that allegation is worthy of being investigated and prosecuted. Where you find as a police officer that what has been reported to you does not warrant such, you then, at that point, you have the discretion to say, no, I don't, this, I'm not going to go further with this. Mm -hmm. But you find that even our policemen, when they know the right thing, they still go um, along with the highest, I mean, the highest bid, anybody who pays them. Oh, the first person, the to, first report person the to report. So they go ahead and charge. But ideally, the police are supposed to be custodians of enforcement of these rights. Okay. Are supposed to have an understanding of when the rights have been violated and when they have not. So in the case of, of this nature, which is a civil matter, between persons who have disagreements, mm -hmm. okay, about okay whether you are expressing a view or not, it's still it's still something that could be amicably resolved, but not to the extent of trying to use the law to punish somebody who's expressed his opinion about a particular issue. So the police also are culpable, and that's why they should also be um, joined in a civil suit to mm -hmm. be filed by Issa Mokwa if he intends to go that route. I would like to find out from Issa Mokwa, who has just joined us back. Issa, um, let's find out from you exactly what the response from the police or whoever it was that they charged with detaining you was. What did they do after you were invited? Were you invited to the police station and what transpired then? And please keep it summary. Isa, we seem to be losing your audio there. If you can fix it, we can't hear you. Uh, we'll ask wait for maybe. him to fix it. Well. Can you hear, Isa, can you hear us that? Isa, let's hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we Loud can. And clear. Go, Go ahead. ahead. All right. Um, like I said, when they came, uh, immediately I was the one who called the police that uh, some okay. people came to attack me at my residence. And immediately, that is the divisional police in the local government that I stay. And immediately they rushed down. So when they rushed down, they took the boat party, the boat of us to the station. Both the five people that drove down to Lapai to come and attack me at my residence. They took us to the police station and we wrote our statements. You know, on that day, they gave us, you know, fair airing and uh, they were treating us equally. Not until when they started bringing their ID card that their government is, their coordinators, their DG and stuff like that. So we wrote our statement and the DPO asked us to come back the following day by 9 a.m. So, so on reaching there the following morning, the DPO now called me that, um, look, the CP, that is the Commissioner of Police, said he has interest in this case. So they are going to take the two of us, me and my friend, the caretaker that came in solidarity, my friend that came in solidarity for the attack. They took the both of us, they took us to the uh, headquarters there. So on reaching to the headquarters, we met, the, the CP was not on scene, it was the, the CP that was on, on seat, and he addressed us, and of course, he stated clearly that the case is a case of DPP, that is the both party are at fault, for them to have visited me at my residence for, for any kind of resolution, whether, and it resulted to this kind of uh, fight, it okay. is a case of uh, All right. DPP. So All immediately right. he said we should go out and settle ourselves, 
And the next thing, I, I started to suspect, you know, some moves. They started receiving calls and all sorts of things. And the next thing, they said we should go to the state uh, CID. And it was not even up to 20 minutes. The next thing we see, you know, they started saying we should write statement. Those other parties, they were not inside with us. And me and my friend, we wrote our statement. We were expecting they would also come and write their statement just the way we did. But we already have a statement from the divisional police and they brought the file, but they didn't use the file. We wrote another statement and we we're expecting the other party will also write their statement. But unfortunately, the next thing they told us was to remove our cars and, you know, submit our phones. Isa, and the next Isa, thing, Isa, they detained us for three nights. Isa, I, I would really like to get the full account of, of this incident. But the, the thing is, we're pressed for time. Yeah. So I, I just want to ask you very quickly, and, and this is a yes or no question. After, was this resolved at the police finally? Did you get an end to the matter, yes or no? No, it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't resolved. It wasn't resolved, because, okay. Uh, we the, 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 did the police aid, did the, police aid the, 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 the governor's appointees, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, and then are the appointees, are they still intimidating you, yes or no? Yeah, to some certain extent, yes, because they wouldn't want me to be talking about this, and they have went as far as writing petition that I should, that I should, you know, the NAMS should, of course, remove me from a, from a member of being the, the NAMS. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Thank and, you, and then, Issa, I, I, Issa, I want to ask you, can you name names? Who are these appointees? Nance president and the zonal coordinator, Mo Abubakar, the coordinator on student matters on A, Mustafa Tijani, the SSA on scholarship in person of uh, Ahmed Evuti, and the JCC chairman, and one Nuruddin is a graduate of the same institution that I graduated from. Okay. All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, so, where exactly does the police fall culpable here in all of this? Where did they fall out of routine? Okay. So, I think from the point where you said the police took them to the state CID, mm -hmm. and then excluded the aides. You know, from the beginning, they said they called them jointly. They both gave their statements, which is normal police procedure to give your statement as to what after transpired. Then the next day, the call from the CP are saying that they have an interest in the file. Because ideally, all police matters should start with the lookout station, which is where it began there. But because the IR ops called for the file, the file was sent to the CP's office, and that's where you saw power play. So what they did was to play their hand and basically in an arbitrary manner to suppress um, Issa's uh, voice and then to basically advance their own course in punishing him. So what they want to do basically is to charge him. Because he mentioned DPP. DPP means the Director of Public Prosecutions. Mm -hmm. So it means that they, are, they intend to prosecute Issa and his caretaker for whatever offense that it is they will come up with. So you can see clearly how a simple civil dispute between two individuals or two groups of persons has now been criminalized to a level where somebody will stand in trial or a person will stand in trial for an offense that is yet unknown. Of course, at some point, they will probably charge him with um, breach of the peace or conspiracy to commit some, some funny offense. But again, it's not until the trial um, goes through the old rigors before you now have a decision. But under our laws, the accused person must attend this trial. So for whatever reason, if, if the case goes to court and is charged to court, it would have to attend trial on every single location. Bail will be set, it would need to attend, it would need to be within jurisdiction, it would not have to leave the state for some reasons. It must attend this trial, and if he's convicted, he will be sentenced to prison. So those are the things that, you know, basically embolden our uh, public office holders, knowing fully well that they can use the instrumentality of the police mm -hmm. to deal with anybody that they have grievances with. So they know as public officers, but individuals may not know. Isa is actually quite knowledgeable himself. However, what about the others, uh, people walking the streets? Regular, street, regular, regular people who don't know. Joe. What do we need to note when it comes to these kinds of cases, especially arrests, especially when it starts at the, uh, um, I almost said fueling station. <laughs> <laughs> do you police, know who I am? <laughs> the police station. What, the, what does the regular citizen need to know about their rights when it comes to being arrested? Okay, so um, two things. I will first and foremost say that you need a lawyer. Everybody who's... Not everybody know, has a lawyer. You, you should try, try, and, try and get one if you can afford one. But secondly, every police station has a human rights center. Most people don't know this. 
Oh. Every police station has an human rights yeah, unit. Human desk. So when you get to the police station and you have any of these issues, ask for the human rights desk. They have it. Now, whether it's fully functional or operational is a different kettle of fish entirely, but they have a human rights desk. And acknowledge that you know that yes. they so, have one. So when you already. ask for a human rights desk, they know that you have an idea of what you're doing. Yeah. So when you get there and you then narrate the issues and you see that this thing is going to go south, you can also escalate it to the Ministry of Justice. I know that in Lagos, the Ministry of Justice has several units that can also assist. The MBA also has a legal aid unit, legal aid to offer free legal services. So there are, se there are several things that are going on in advocacy to ensure that people are educated and enlightened about their rights. But of course, when people don't know their rights, it's easy for the, um, the oppressors mm -hmm. to have their day. Look, I want to say thank you so much, uh, Dr. DDG. And just to add, there's also <laughs> one more desk that is there. Landlord and tenant. Did you know? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was surprised when I found out there was one. You had some issues? Yeah, my father. Landlord. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let's say thank you to Isa. Isa, thank you very much. And we'll continue to follow the story as it goes. We're hoping that you would not be intimidated further after now. But trust that we'll like to know exactly how this follows through. Thank you very much, Isa Mokwa. And also, thank you very much, Sakai Odeji, for joining us yet again. Thank you and, for having uh, me. Yeah, thanks for that very interesting piece of information, because I did not know that until today. All right, well, right. thank I'm you. Great. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Now, stay tuned, because we have a very interesting um, story coming your way yet again. And this also breaches on the freedom of speech when it comes to investigative journalism. Join us again real soon. We'll be back with that big story. Welcome back. Now, in a developing and deeply concerning case, the Nigerian police have broken their silence regarding the arrest of the anonymous whistleblower known as Pidom, who has been missing for weeks. Pidom, who gained notoriety for exposing corruption and government malpractice, was reportedly arrested in what the police described as a well-coordinated effort. This arrest has sparked widespread concerns, with many fearing for Pidom's safety and the implications this could have for whistleblowers in general and freedom of expression in Nigeria. Now, the situation took a darker turn as reports emerged that PDOM may have been subjected to abduction and torture. Various sources, including activists and human rights organizations, are raising alarms about the police's role in what they describe as an unlawful and inhumane act. Now, the, the secrecy surrounding PDOM's arrest has only fueled public outrage leading to questions about the integrity of law enforcement and the protections of citizens' rights. So as the story continues to unfold, the public is demanding answers from the authorities, not just about PDOM's whereabouts, but also about the broader implications of this case for justice and accountability in Nigeria. The pressure is mounting on the Nigerian police force and other implicated security agencies to clarify their actions and respect the rights of those who speak out against corruption and injustice. So to help us dive into this issue, we are joined by David Hundai, the investigative journalist who was responsible for breaking this story. Now, his work has shed light on the critical situation surrounding PIDOM and the risk faced by whistleblowers in Nigeria. Well, David, I want to say thank you so much for, for joining us today. And let me start by asking that since you broke the story with other pressures and with the other pressures, especially with the police finally admitting uh, to having PDOM in custody. But before we go into that uh, and the press release, uh, for the sake for, of anyone just getting to know the story, may not know who PDOM is and all of that, how did the information uh, about his disappearance come to you? Okay, so first of all, for those who don't know PDOM, um, it's, uh, he is an anonymous whistleblower, primarily using Twitter, who um, gets uh, information from you know, up to and including the highest levels of government and puts them out to the public in the interest of the public. So the term, the name PIDOM is an acronym that actually stands for people in distress or missing, right? So because that was how the handle got started. It started as a sort of counter effort to people who were getting kidnapped. So it was like a sort of one man's effort to try and sort out these problems. Now, um, sometime on Thursday morning, which is three days ago now, I, I checked my, my Twitter account, as I often do, and I saw a message from this handle 
bearing in mind that I hadn't spoken to this guy in a couple of weeks, we had had a bit of a fallout, but that's a story for another day. So I saw a message from, from him and I opened the message and the message said, um, actually, this isn't Pidom. And it was someone claiming to be someone close to him. And supposedly, this person said that the instruction from Pidom was to hand over the Twitter account to me, that Pidom apparently had been arrested in Port Harcourt and had been transferred to the False Criminal Investigation Department in Abuja under the auspices of the National Cyber Crime Center of, of the Nigerian Police Force. And supposedly, um, uh, uh, Pidom's instructions were that this account should be handed over to me and that I should keep on tweet, I should, I should use the account and basically impersonate him, pretend to be him, and that in, in doing so, that that would somehow create an, an alibi for, um, for him, which would sort of get him off. And the evidence that was provided for this was, a, was a, an administrative bill sheet. And supposedly the, the instruction was log into his account, start tweeting in his voice, act as if everything is all right, and somehow that will be used as an alibi with the Nigeria Police Force. Now, obviously, being, being, being that I wasn't born yesterday, I immediately smelled a rat. Because first of all, I took a look at the, the administrative bill sheet. Um, the, the surety that was demanded was either a federal civil servant, a level 16 civil servant, with a property worth 500 million naira, which is mathematically impossible for a level 16 civil servant to, to own legally, or a private business person with property worth 500 million naira in the FCT, who would then have to drop their, their tax clearance certificate, their CAC certificate, and what the, the, it's basically an impossible set of bill conditions, right? They had no intention of letting this person go. Bearing in mind that 500 million naira is more than two, is 200 million naira more than the bail amount that was set for Godwin and MFLA, the former CBN governor. So clearly there was no intention to let this person go. And I, I instantly suspected that I was speaking to um, an intelligence operative or, or at the very least someone working for the government pretending to be close to Pidom. So the instruction from this person was do not go public with this under any circumstances, keep this hush hush, pretend to be him. And then the person sent me login details um, which kept failing, but eventually he's, um, he or she sent me a login detail, which actually worked, and I actually gained access to Pidom's account. Um, so immediately I gained access to the account, I immediately changed the account password and two-factor authentication so that only I had access to it. So I basically locked everybody else out of the account who might have been logged into the account. And then as soon as that happened, all of my, like, well, not all, but most of my personal accounts and devices started having security problems. Someone started trying to hack into my WhatsApp. Someone started trying to hack into my Telegram. Um, I don't know how many attempts were made to hack into my Twitter. Um, a sort of very suspicious two-factor authentication code was sent to my WhatsApp, which I was later informed could potentially be something called a zero-click exploit. A zero-click exploit is a, type, is a type of uh, malware which is sent to your phone, which you don't actually have to click on or open, which is quite called a zero-click exploit, which is a very expensive thing to do, by the way. And as far as I'm aware, only state-level actors have access to that sort of a spyware, which is sold by Israeli groups like, uh, like uh, NSO Group. As a result of that, I've actually had to replace most of my devices between Thursday and today due to security concerns. Um, so I decided that the only thing that makes sense to do in this situation is to go public with it because based on the fact that whoever this person is I was spoke, that I was speaking to has given me access to Pidom's account. So I know for a fact that Pidom cannot be safe. Something has to be going on here. Mm -hmm. So I went public with it. I, I put all this information out on, on my Substack, um, which goes out to I think 50,000 subscribers or so. And yeah, the, the very next day, bear in mind that this someone who was supposedly taken in on the 5th of August, so that's more than two and a half weeks now. The very next day, when this story started going everywhere, it raised the, it became a national story. Then the police, for the first time, mm -hmm. so, came out and acknowledged mm -hmm. that they actually supposedly have this person in 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 custody who they suspect of being paid on after two and a half weeks. Bear in mind that under the under Nigerian law, you're not supposed to be detained for more than 48 hours without charge. Okay. Two and a half weeks without sitting in front of a judge. Finally, they acknowledged it, and then they rushed out a statement saying that they're going to take him to court 
Next David, week, which we don't David see. if you don't mind, David, um, you, you've said a couple of things I wanted to get confirmation on. First of all, you, you're telling that they also try to hack into your account. Do you, you, you feel that you were being sucked into this whole mix as well, perhaps? Is that what you feel? It, yes, in multiple ways. First of all, um, if uh, you are trying to log into a Twitter account or a Gmail account, whoever is currently logged into that account can see the location of any attempted logins. Mm. So it then, could be, first of all, that someone was trying to get hold of my location, first of all. And then secondly, the instruction to log into the account of a missing person and pretend to be them. If I had done that, if I had been foolish enough to do that, that could well have been yeah. a successful attempt to give me, to rope me into some sort of criminal exactly. case, potentially so, with the international ramifications. Another thing is, Pedum's, at this time, Pedum, uh, well, you hadn't identified exactly where Pedum was, so he's still missing at this time. But now that the police has come out to tell exactly that they have arrested him, have they indicated exactly why he was arrested in the first place? What crimes did or he the commit? the crimes that he committed. So um, the first spokesperson, Muiwa Adejobi, released a statement yesterday where he claimed, amongst other things, that um, this uh, person was arrested for involvement in subversive activity, whatever that may mean. In fact, let me let me read out the statement. So it says, uh, in a well-coordinated effort, officials from the National Nigeria Police Force National Cyber Crime Center apprehended Bristol Isaac Tamuno B. Efiri, also known as PIDOM, on allegations of committing serious offenses that undermine the integrity of government operations. Okay. There are several allegations that would against the suspect, including unlawful possession, leakage of classified documents, cyber-related offenses, and others. So essentially what he's been accused of is being a whistleblower, because that's okay. what whistleblowers do. They get hold of classified information and release them to the public. Now that that's identified, they also released a picture. Now you mentioned that PDAM is, until now, anonymous. Can you confirm who this person was, uh, this picture that was released? Would you like to confirm if this is PDAM or not? It's impossible for me to say because the kind of relationship we had never involved him sharing such information with me. So he never shared his government name with me, never shared his, his photograph, never shared his address, his actual physical location, he never shared his family situation. So we were friends on the internet and we we're friends by virtue of the connectedness of the work that we do. I and mean, we collaborated a number of times. Mm. But if, so it will be impossible for me to say that this is or is not Peter. All right, thank you so much for that confirmation. I understand that uh, yourself and uh, certain persons uh, put out a press statement. Uh, can you take us through some of the uh, main points or the pain points of uh, uh, that statement, please? So the first was to um, push back on the narrative being promoted by Muiwa Adejobi that somehow this person has committed serious offenses. By first of all, pointing out that the police, in fact, has committed a serious offense here by abducting a, 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 an, un, an unarmed civilian, a Nigerian citizen, because that wasn't an arrest, that was an abduction. If it was an arrest, first of all, the manner of its, of its uh, execution would have been very different. Apparently, there were more than 15 fully armed men dressed in mufti, right? They weren't wearing uniform, who burst in like armed robbers and, and first of all, thoroughly beat this person up and then took him in, and then, you know, before he was transferred to, to Abuja, first of all. Secondly, upon being transferred to FCID in Abuja, he was kept in solitary confinement for six days, handcuffed for six days without food for six days. Bear in mind that under international law, using starvation as a punishment is actually classed as a war crime. It's classed as a crime against humanity. The Nigerian police force did that to someone who's, who's Current crime was being a whistleblower, which, by the way, is actually not a crime in Nigeria. Then we also pushed back on uh, on, on on the narrative that somehow um, the activities that this person was apparently arrested for required this level of priority. Because I pointed out, for example, that um, the uh, actions of, of, of the Nigeria police force, amongst other things, which led to the most recent uh, uh, round of protests in the country, the end bad governance protests, have not been addressed by the police. The lack of professionalism within the police has not been addressed. Those are far bigger priorities 
than going after some, you know, anonymous whistleblower somewhere, allegedly. And then we also pointed out that um, technically or supposedly Nigeria is supposed to be a country under law. Nigeria purports to be a democracy. And in a democracy, and in a country under law, there are certain processes for doing things. So if someone is being accused of these things, most of which, by the way, are civil offenses, right? Because if the, the statement from the police is saying that there are petitions that have been uh, submitted by several people, these are, these, these are civil matters, right? You are supposed to invite the person to come into the, uh, to, to speak to the police. You don't carry out this sort of Gestapo operation, you know, using all manner of secret technology and whatnot to locate and track someone who supposedly is this person and then sort of do this sort of um, rendition across state lines from Potako to Abuja. As far as I'm aware, there is very little basis for that under Nigerian law, but apparently the Nigerian police is, is sort of a, a law unto itself. And then finally, we pointed out that um, we shouldn't even be talking about the, a trial or being arraigned in front of a judge or anything like that, because the manner of his arrest in the first place, the, or rather the manner of his abduction, negates any, any, any purported basis for there being some sort of recourse to the law because the actions of the police were illegal to begin with. We cannot build legality on top of illegality if we claim to be a country under law. In other words, he must be released immediately and we shouldn't even be talking about a court or a court date because the very process through which this thing was initiated was illegal. All right. I must also ask about, um, uh, first of all, to speak to the conditions of uh, of uh, uh, Pedom and his arrest. Do you know where he's been held um, and what his condition is like? So as a Friday afternoon, um, we had eyes on him. Um, we had a team member who actually, who visually sighted him and confirmed that um, he was alive and well. Maybe well would be overstating it, but he was definitely alive. Um, but um, in doing so, um, it also became very clear that this person has suffered torture over the past two and a half weeks. There are marks all over his body. He looks physically emaciated because clearly um, he's not been eating well, if at all. Bear in mind that for the first six days he was starved. And since then, the condition has not much improved. In fact, one of the major things that the intervention team on ground in Abuja has been doing is getting food across to him because he's actually apparently not being fed in 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 in, uh, in FCID custody um the set of clothes that he was arrested in or that he was abducted in on August 5 in Port Harcourt are the same set of clothes that he's still wearing up till now so as you can imagine there are you know significant um, you know hygiene concerns there the FCID is not permitting him to to do basic you know sanitary activities you, you can imagine how unpleasant that might be mm -hmm. um he also needs uh, healthcare attention because for the one week where he was handcuffed and you know circulation to his wrists were cut off, which by the way, the marks are still very visible. There's a possibility that there's some sort of um, infection that might have taken um, hold there. It's impossible to say without him seeing a doctor first. Needless to say, he has not been given any access to any sort of healthcare professional. And uh, over and above all this, um, it's difficult to say what his state of mind is because um, if you are thrown into a, essentially a dungeon for six days without food, without seeing another human being, without knowing whether you're going to make it out, you know, alive, and the only reason your story has even come to national, um, the forefront of national consciousness is because your captors try to rope someone else in who happens to then go public with it. And it's impossible to say whether you were actually going to it's impossible to say whether they actually had any intention of letting you survive this before this became public. So it's difficult to say the um, the impact that this has had on his mental state. And then, as I yesterday, the latest update was when we tried to send a, a lawyer to speak to him, the police has apparently restricted all access to him. They're not allowing anyone to speak to him because clearly they don't want him um, feeding any more information mm -hmm. that can get out into the public about his treatment. Now, now David, so, I... Um, I'm also very concerned about how you're going about this because you have been responsible for also making some retweets. So I'm wondering how your sense of security is right now, what you feel, how you're attending to that. But regarding some of
of the retweets that you've made. You made a retweet from a uh, Jimmy Hulk LP, and I'm going to read that verbatim. Um, this retweet talked about, hang on a second, I think I just lost it. If, it's right there on the screen. It's right there on the screen. Well, there it is. Let me read it from the screen. It says, if you sent PDOM Nigeria any classified information via Twitter, uh, DM, and you are in Nigeria, make yourselves invisible ASAP. It goes on to tell that you should change your location, get rid of your SIM, do not use the internet. Now, how credible is this? Well, obviously, you tweeted it. So give us some more context on this and why it was that you felt the need to uh, retweet this information. Well, so the the gentleman who, who tweeted this is someone who's actually um, phys uh, personally known to me. I know him quite well. And I know that he happens to have um, contacts within the, uh, the Nigeria Immigration Service amongst other parts of the Nigerian intelligence community. So we actually had a conversation yesterday and um, he, he informed me that um, he, based on the information he has been getting out of that and other parts of the intelligence community, um, prior to when this failed attempt to rope me into this scheme was made, um, apparently the, the police and the intelligence community have already um, trolled through the Twitter account of, of PIDOM you know, uh, before I got access to it and locked them out. So apparently um, the goal of doing that was to try and get hold of his sources, to try and find out who has been feeding him information. Bear in mind that the information that has been leaked by PIDOM has been so embarrassing to the government to the extent that the Secretary General of the Federation, uh, Akume, has, I think as recently as June, came out and reiterated to civil servants that um, the, there are consequences under the Official Secrets Act for leaking classified information because bear in mind, PDOM leaked, has leaked documents up to and including the very presidency itself, um, documents which the government obviously has found very embarrassing. So um, the goal of the primary goal of, of one of the primary goals of this operation was to find out who these sources are. So um, according to this fellow's source, there is every indication that in the coming few weeks, there's going to be some sort of which hunts within the Nigerian public service, especially at federal level, to try and get hold of people who have been feeding information to PIDOM Nigeria. Because clearly um, what this government values is not actually doing its job. What it values is regime security, regime protection, and apparently mm -hmm. keeping a, its information airtight, even if it's information about its gross malfeasance, is a far bigger priority than actually doing its job. David, I have to ask you about your own, I mean, Mazuno sort of leaned to us there in the beginning, and I have to ask you, right, um, giving uh, PDOM's uh, now arrest or abduction from the description of all of this, one has to ask about your own safety and what it means for press freedom and also whistleblowers as well. I mean, to my knowledge, whistleblowing is not even a crime, and the, the anti-craft agency um, uh, calls for whistleblowers uh, in the system and actually provides a reward for whistleblowers. Why the sudden change now and what does it mean for pr freedom of, uh, of press and expression and dissent, especially for persons like yourself? Well, so as I said, um, the fact that the type of information being put out by PIDOM was information that was that far reaching. Let me give an an example of this. So this was shortly after Tinumbu took office. So I think this was sometime, I think this might be late last year, early this year, I'm mixing up the timeline. But if you recall, during the UN General Assembly, I think this was last year actually, um, when uh, the president and his son traveled to New York and the leak was then made that the budget for this extravaganza, which included several senior members of the government, and which included um, uh, a, a very expensive hotel in New York and the services of exotic dancers, quote unquote, uh, that all of this was funded through the um, excess wheat grain levy account, which was essentially a, a federal account, which was instituted uh, by the Good Luck Jonathan government to hold the proceeds of a levy on imported wheat grain, which was part of the cassava bread promotion policy. So that was a policy that was intended to make Nigeria self-sufficient in flour production by discouraging imports of wheat grain. 
And instead of using that money for what it was intended for, the president apparently took that money without appropriation and used it to fund a jamboree in New York, a jamboree that, uh, according to reports, included use of cocaine and use of uh, dancers, if you catch where I'm going with this. And the president's son was apparently, was apparently part of this entourage, even though Sheikh Tinubu has no position in government. Apparently, first son is a thing now. This obviously caused a lot of embarrassment to the president and to the presidency. And this was 100% PDOM's leak. So when you were having a, a whistleblower operating at that level, which to the best of my knowledge is pretty much unprecedented in Nigeria, especially for an anonymous whistleblower, mm. um, I would imagine that the, uh, the government would have considered this to be, um, you know, putting yourself into the mind of the Nigerian government that sees information as a threat and that sees people having access to information as a threat to regime security, I would assume that the government would have seen this as a top priority, which is why it's not a coincidence that in you know the same time period where we had 20 medical students getting kidnapped and the government sort of just keeping mum about it until we heard that they were supposedly rescued yesterday and then one of them came out and said, no, they weren't rescued, the ransoms were actually paid. We don't know the truth of that matter. We probably never will. But during that same timeline, is when all these resources were being dedicated to locate one whistleblower somewhere in Port Harcourt, right? Because bear in mind, this is if you have 15 armed men going into arrest one person, the actual the size of the team behind those 15 armed men can be three or four times that. So you might have 50 people working on this operation. The sheer amount of manpower that would have been dedicated at the National Cyber Crime Center, the FCID, and whichever other parts of the intelligence community that, that was coordinating with this, I've heard that there was involvement from the NSA's office as well. So the sheer amount of manpower that would have been dedicated to this, I think it just really says it all about yeah. um, the, the level of priority that was assigned to this by the government. So Damn. as for where that leaves people like me, well, I mean, you shouldn't really be asking that question because, I mean, I've, yeah. I've sat in this seat several times and answered questions that are directly yes, related to things concerning well, my yeah, well, just, he, it doesn't look he, like that's From a human perspective, time. very concerned for you. Um, well, let's go back to your uh, press release now. You also implicated the judiciary, um, uh, talking about the complicity of the Nigerian judiciary uh, in this matter. Could you elaborate on that, please, and the implications as well? And if you can summarize, because we're almost out of time. Mm. Well, so um, specifically regarding the arrest of apparently more than 2,000 and bad governance protesters nationwide. And the fact that these people, for the most part, are still remanded, the judiciary is highly complicit because in the first place, if someone is being arrested for, a, for an offense that doesn't exist, it's the job of the judiciary to immediately set them free. These people were arrested for protesting. Protesting is a protected right under the Nigerian constitution. Nigerians have freedom of speech, freedom of association. These are, these are inalienable rights under the Nigerian constitution. These are, these are on the first page of the Nigerian constitution. So there's no way that the judiciary should see the Nigerian police force or DSS or whoever hauling people in under all these trumped up charges. But the real underlying charge is that these people are protesting and the government sees a protest as an attempted regime change operation and as a threat to regime security. So it holds in protesters to have a chilling effect on other people who may be considering protesting. The judiciary under no circumstances should see that and actually agree to remand these people in prison and actually agree to, um, to uh, conduct a trial for these people. These people committed no offense. They were out on the streets protesting. They have every right to do that. There's nothing wrong with protesting. And if the government doesn't like, or the executive doesn't like that people are protesting, well, tough luck. There's, there's actually supposed to be nothing the executive can do about it as long as it's a peaceful protest which for the most part it was you cannot arrest people for protesting protesting right. is a right uh, David, so for the judiciary to then be complicit in this yes um that leaves us in the situation we're in we have a complicit judiciary 
Okay. We're, we're going for an ad break very quickly, but before we do, I have to ask you about this because we're really pressed for time. So if you can answer me very briefly, I wouldn't mind. Um, it, one of his arrest is, he's, one of the complexities of his case, of this arrest, is that he most likely went against the Official Secrets Act by leaking official information of the government uh, to the public. And this is a criminal offense. I have to ask, how would he intend to maneuver that very quickly in less than 30 seconds because we have to go a press for time? Well, first of all, it's, it's up to the state to prove its own case. It's up to the state to even prove that this Bristol Isaac person that they arrested is actually the of Nigeria. And then after doing that, it's then up to them to prove that um, he intentionally set out to defame the government by putting out information that he knew was classified. So it's one thing to know this colloquially, it's another thing to prove it in court. So we look forward to that. All right, well, David, David thank you. Thank, thank you very you much, so David. Much. It's good to know we're still friends. We'll be coming back to you with thank other you, um, very interesting stories. If you stick around here on Breakfast Extra, we'll be back. It's time for us to bring you breakfast headlines and we begin in West Africa, Nigeria, where the Director General of the National Intelligence Agency, NIA, has uh, handed over his resignation. He submitted his resignation to President Bola Tinubu after serving nearly seven years in the position. Abu Bakr, who was appointed by former President Ahmad, uh, Amadou Mohamedou Buhari, confirmed the development while speaking to journalists. He stated that President Tinubu has accepted his resignation describing the move as a routine procedure. He also expressed gratitude to the president for allowing him to serve for the first 15 months of the new administration, having occupied the office since 2018. And out to the economy, as President Bola Tinubu says, his administration has been sensitive to the citizens' needs and yearnings amid economic challenges confronting the country, stressing that different steps are being taken to address the challenges Tunumbu's comments ca came on the heels of intense criticism that his government has not cut down the cost of governance as it recently procured a presidential jet reportedly worth one $100 million. Speaking at the graduation ceremony of the course 32 of the National Defense College in Abuja, Tunumbu stated that his administration had made significant strides in addressing some challenges encountered by the citizens. And now on to health, but this time in East Africa, with over 100 and with 171 confirmed cases of the Mpox virus in Burundi, and more than half of the districts affected, the isolation center at King Khalid Hospital in Bunjaburi is Bura, I beg your pardon, is seeking is seeing more and more patients. While Mpox has been known for decades, a new, more deadly and more transmissible. A uh, strain known as Clyde 1B has driven the recent surge in cases. According to the World Health Organization, which has declared an international health emergency over the latest outbreak, Clyde 1B causes death in about 3.6% of cases with children more at risk. Campaigning began in Mozambique on Saturday, six weeks before the Southern African nation goes to the polls in a general election. Voters were cast pilots for president, uh, parliament and regional authorities in the October 9 poll in which, president six, uh, which, which current president, 69-year-old President Felipe Unyusi, cannot stand for another term. His ruling Free Limo party has won every national election in the country since the end of a brutal civil war. Uh, it fought with uh, Ranoma, uh, the main opposition and a former rebel group. Move away from that now, and this time to North Africa, where Sudan's de facto ruler, Army Chief Abdul Fattah al bohan says his government would not join peace talks with rival paramilitaries in Switzerland, vowing instead to fight for 100 years. Bohan, whose troops have been battling the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, RSF, for over 60 months, made this known on Saturday in Port Sudan. The United States opened talks in uh, the United States opened talks in Switzerland on August 14th, aimed at easing the human suffering and achieving a lasting ceasefire. 
Algerians have expressed mixed feelings about President Abdul Majid Tovan's record ahead of the presidential election on 7 September. The president, who st stats as the clear favorite, is hoping to win a second term in office on the back of what he considers to be a successful economic record. Five years after the pro-democracy Hirak movement fizzled out, hopes of big change have faded, leaving some of the population feeling disillusioned. And now on to Libya. An agreement between armed groups and security organizations has been reached in Tripoli to diffuse the serious tensions that have gripped the Libyan capital for several weeks. Plagued by chaos since the fall and death of uh, Gaddafi in 2011, Libya is governed by two rival executives, Abdul Hamid Daba's UN-recognized government of national unity in the West and, and the other in the East, backed by Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar. And that's all at this hour for Breakfast Extra. I am Judith Atibi, or rather for Breakfast Headlines. I am Judith Atibi. Stay with us as more on the other side. Welcome back. Third hour now for Breakfast Extra. The Nigerian economy is facing yet another grim challenge as the crisis in port operations deepens, threatening the livelihood of approximately 40,000 workers. According to recent investigations, the ongoing slump in activities at the major port uh, formations across the country has reached a critical point with fears mounting that without swift and effective intervention, the situation could lead to mass job losses. The economic downturn exacerbated by the sharp decline in port operations underscores the urgent need for comprehensive policy reforms and infrastructural investment to stabilize this vital sector. Now, the ripple effects of this port crisis are being felt across various sectors, particularly in industries reliant on imports and exports. Stakeholders have expressed concern about the delays, inefficiencies and high operational costs associated with Nigerian ports are driving businesses away for the straining and already fragile economy. As the nation grapples with this alarming trend, there are calls for the government to address the underlining issues, including outdated infrastructure, bureaucratic bottlenecks, and security challenges that have plagued the ports for years. So today we look into this pressing issue with our guest, Abdullahi Aliu Maiwada the National Public Relations Officer of the Nigerian Customs Service to help shed light on the current state of port operations and the potential measures that can be taken to avert this looming crisis. Mr. So, Waida, you are welcome. Thank you very much for joining us this morning on Breakfast Extra. A very good morning to you and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. So, I um, would like to know, how has the recent slump in port operations specifically affected the day-to-day -day activities of the Nigerian Customs Service? And what measures are being implemented to help mitigate these challenges that are being faced currently with the economic situation we have now in Nigeria? Well, um, let me start by slightly disagreeing with um, your background about um, the status of ports uh, in Nigeria. We are not where we ought to be. Yes, um, there is always room for improvements. Our ports can be better than what they are. But however, I believe um, uh, we are not doing too badly as um, portrayed by, uh, by your um, background. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I will be able to talk within the context of um, our responsibilities as major port operators. We are not um, uh, uh, in charge of the port party, but um, we have a sole responsibility of um, uh, staying in what is called custom ports uh, in line with our acts to ensure that we enforce some regulation, fiscal policies of the government. Now, government administration uh, all over the world, um, uh, oh, sorry, customs administration all over the world have started shifting from uh, uh, emphasis on um, revenue generation and looking at uh, other measures that um, uh, have to do with um, trade facilitation as well as um, effectively managing security. Now, we have major ports in Nigeria. Uh, we have ports more basically in Lagos, and there are even ports that are coming up in the future. I would like to give you an example. We have the Lakey Deep uh, Seaport that come up. It's a transshipment hub, and we are looking at the possibility of uh, very soon it's going to be one of the hubs 
put a shipment within the region. It's uh, coming up, and good has started coming up through that um, uh, port. It's uh, a port that is designed in line with the best practices all over the world. And um, I think it will also be able to compete across the region and um, uh, serve uh, Nigerians. Then within the major traditional ports we are used to, we have ports such as um, uh, the Apapa port, which is the premier port uh, in Nigeria. It brings more revenue into the coffers of government in terms of import duties. It's a port that collects an um, average of um, more than a billion in a day, in a working day. So most of uh, the items that comes into bulk importation comes into a purple port. So I believe uh, all those ports, uh, uh, Tinkan Island port, we have PTML port, uh, PTML port and multi-terminal uh, port limited PTML. It's also a port that specializes in Roro, which will roll on roll of um, cargoes that non contrarialized cargo, contrarialized cargo. So we have also uh, other aspects of our port, like the KLT, which is another port. We have the Tinkan Island port. We are working on even um, trying to create more commands within trying to, although it's still in progress, I may not want to comment on that until that the process is completed. We are trying to look at the possibility of creating command from even Tinkan Island port. We have the Snake Island. Those are three trade zones and that um, are really uh, boosting in terms of input. However, there are challenges. Yeah. But um, we will accept those mm -hmm. challenges. Uh, 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 the issue of infrastructure, we understand, uh, is, is an issue that uh, uh, needs to be improved. If you move around the world, the issue of automation of our ports, uh, that is mostly the use of non-intrusive inspection technology. As I'm talking to you, the CDC and some management members, members of steering committee, are on their way to, to China, or they are in China. And the base of China is... Um, going to China is to, uh, to, to, com to complete um, uh, the, the, the inspection, uh, uh, factory inspection of um, non-intrusive inspection equipment that is scanners that will be coming in uh, as part of uh, the trade modernization project of uh, the Nigeria Customs Service. We have some, but we are looking forward to bringing more scanners that we use to be able to uh, uh, um, uh, scan and fast track facilitate trade. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, one thing that is uh, very important is um, the Nigeria Customs Service has a new act, which is Nigeria Customs Service Act 2023. The act um, uh, specifically has provided so many platforms, so many innovations mm -hmm. uh, for uh, port efficiency. For instance, in the previous law, we do not have um, any room, uh, any legal backing for post clearance audit. Uh, in the previous law, we do not have room for authorized economic operator scheme. We do not have room for uh, 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 terminal operators to provide non-intrusive inspection technology. Those are legal frameworks that are okay. enable custom now mm -hmm. to perform better. All right, Mr. As Mayweather. I'm talking to you again, a team from the Blue Sea or Custom Organization are out for what you call validation for okay. our pilot scheme of our authorized economic operators. Now, Which, Mr. Um, maybe I need to define what is an AU. Thank you. Mr. Mayweather, I I'd like to take you on um, some of the, uh, well, great job that the customs is doing in the ports, but um, I'm very cognizant with some of the port operations, especially going way back into the 80s and 90s. Regarding the jobs, and I'd like us to focus on these jobs and the potential that we might be losing these 40,000 jobs um, mm. from this mm. sector. Back in the 90s or early 2000s, you mentioned Roro. If you take a drone shot of the ports right now, you'd find out that the capacity of imports that are coming into the country is not even up to one-tenth of what it used to be from 2000 and perhaps, let's say, 2001 up until 2005. Many people have argued that this is because of some of the duties that have to be paid by importers that they can no longer afford, especially this year. It's dropped significantly that some people have already changed jobs saying that they cannot continue in these, uh, this kind of business. So this is the situation right now. This is the challenge that not just the ports are experiencing, but now it's now a, a thing of individuals losing their jobs. How has or what can the custom service, what actions are they taking to help mitigate these effects of the economy on the individuals who work at the port? Thank you for shaping the conversation. You don't want me to take the conversation away from you. You're a very good presenter. Uh, let's talk about uh, the jobs you are saying. Uh, I believe um, I, I am not here to, to sugarcoat issues. Yes, based on the data we have, 
there is significant decline in the cargo throughput. Yes, uh, the economic situation uh, is um, not peculiar to Nigeria. It's an issue that is an aftermath of what happened in 2020, and it's still we are still recovering from uh, uh, those uh, kind of issues. The meltdown uh, issue, um, the fluctuation of Nera. Those are many factors that I think are, are reasons for the decline in cargo throughput. However, what have we done as a service uh, to mitigate this? Number one, I, I was very clear about that is why when I started, I was not really empathetic about um, making emphasis about um, uh, 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 the, the amount of revenue we have collected as a, as a service. Because you have this perception that uh, the collection of revenue is what affects um, the loss of job, vis-a-vis uh, -vis loss of job uh, in the port. So let me be specific too. What will foster more jobs uh, within uh, the, the APO system of um, uh, maritime industry? Uh, I think is number one is ability to facilitate trade. Having trade facilitation uh, uh, strategies in place. Now, uh, the Nigeria Customs Service have, um, in collaboration with the MPA, if you can realize the congestion in those ports have been cleared and it was a deliberate issue, and it was an intentional issue based on collaboration with the relevant stakeholders to reduce, uh, to have create a way, a better way in and out of our ports. That is number one hindrance. Number two, Nigeria Custom Service have introduced, um, uh, uh, I have mentioned AEO. AEO is a, is a, is a, is a WCO standard based on what we call safe framework of standard. After uh, the September 11 uh, attack in USA, the WCO in 2005 came up with what we call safe framework of standard. And those safe framework of standard uh, have like uh, three pillars. We have what, you call, what is called custom to custom corporations. That is how will custom relate with custom administration all over the world. Custom to other government agencies and co customs to businesses. So you can see it's try to create a bridge, a gap between how will custom relate with businesses, how will custom relate with um, uh, custom administration, and how will customs um, relate uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with other government agencies. So right. those three pillars are the prisms in which we operate. Now, uh, we have uh, that authorized economic uh, uh, operators is a trade facilitation tool in, in line with um, WTO trade facilitation agreement. It allows for, if you are a compliant trader, and we seem to see you compliant and you have passed our criteria, you are going to be given a kind of a trusted, trusted trader scheme, which is more better than what um, you used to do, fast track, which means you can pick your container and you are trusted. And we have two types of AEO. We have security, AEO security, and, and AEO compliance. So if, whether you are a fresh border, whether you are an importer, whether you are a client agent, whether you are an SME, you stand to benefit from this uh, trade facilitation tool. All right. Now, early this year, we don't know what is called, we want to be very empirical in what we are doing. All right. We launched what is called uh, time release studies. Time release studies is a studies that is done to identify the time required to import items from arriving at the port to the time of release of that item. Yeah, it's but this, these, are these, these are all systems. These are systems, right? Um, let's look at the report mm. once again and look at some of the concerns that this report raised. It highlights uh, concerns about outdated infrastructure. And you mentioned a couple of uh, refineries. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Forgive me. Ports. One of them, the Lekki ports, the, uh, the Tinkan ports, uh, and uh, the, all the other ports that you mentioned earlier. But the report highlights concerns about outdated re uh, infrastructure uh, contributing, you know, to uh, to the inefficiencies of the sports. What plans are in place, you know, to to modernize the port facilities, and how soon can we expect, you know, these improvements to impact operations by extension, the jobs and the quality of lives for the workers? Well, um, uh, infrastructure cannot work on its own without a standard procedures. So they work hand in hand. And if you don't have the standard procedures, whether you have an infrastructure, it won't work. So as a custom officer, I will speak as I don't provide infrastructure. I can only talk about infrastructure within the context of Nigeria Custom Service. Now, if your processes are cumbersome, let me just give you an example. What is trade facilitation? 
what is if you go and look at what is called revised Kyoto Convention, it has to do with what simplification, standardization, harmonization, and automation of customs processes and procedures. Simply, all right. And these issues you have mentioned, if you are able to put all those standards in 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 good context in the right way, you will be able to facilitate trade. And with trade facilitation you'll be able to improve. There will be job creation. There will be more import, more exports. And we shouldn't concentrate on import only. There are exports. We have a dedicated export command, which is dedicated for export. All right. So uh, we, we talk about balance of trade. Right. If you are talking of job creation, wait, wait. we should uh, not concentrate Mr. on import-dependent economy. Mr. But rather, there should be a balance of trade. Mr. Mawaida, I do have to ask them, because you're saying that, uh, OK, we're pressed for time. We cannot go. But what has the government's uh, support been like? Because you're saying that uh, the report highlights all of this, uh, this thing, uh, all of the, the infrastructural inefficiencies with the system. But what level of government support or intervention uh, do you have currently or, do, or does the support need? Very quickly, in 30 seconds, because we're pressed for time. In 30 seconds, the government have given us an enabling legal framework. Number two, we have a trade modernization project for 20 years that is oncoming. It's aimed to uh, create an end-to-end -end automation of all custom processes and procedures. The ports uh, will be E. We have decongested the port. The government have given us an enabling environment to decongest the port. That's why all uh, cargoes, overtime cargoes, have been uh, cleared off. And there's space for now, economic space for uh, importers uh, to import their goods into Nigeria. So there are a lot of things that I will say, but um, all right. uh, because of time, I will say uh, there is room for improvement. But... Um, we are doing our best to make sure that within our functions, we facilitate trade, thereby All creating right. more jobs and our port will be more efficient. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayweather. I appreciate much. you for doing this with mm. us. Yes, indeed. Stay tuned now because we've got coming your way a very interesting one where we take a look at the new Justice Olukayode uh, Arola as he steps out and Kikiri Ekun taking on the mantle as the new Chief Justice of Nigeria. We explore what this leadership change means for the nation's legal landscape. Stay with us. The appointment of Justice Kikeri Ekun as Nigeria's new Chief Justice has ignited a crucial conversation about the urgent need for judicial reforms as the first female chief justice in, in, uh, in years, or rather the first, but she is second historically, her leadership marks a significant milestone, but it also comes with heightened expectations. With a judiciary often criticized for its inefficiencies and corruption, Justice Kekere Ekun's uh, uh, tenure is seen as a pivotal moment to restore faith in the system and introduce much-needed reforms. However, Justice Kikere Kun's appointment has not been without its challenges. Recent reports have surfaced alleging that she was barred from entering the United States due to a controversial ruling she made in the past. This incident has raised serious questions about the integrity of Nigeria's judiciary and the international implications of her leadership. As she steps into the critical role, the eyes of the nation are on how she will address these controversies and lead the judiciary forward. Hmm. And so to help us navigate these complex issues and also uh, to discuss this in further detail, we're joined by, we're joined, uh, by a video a chat, the former governor of Cross River State, His Excellency, Mr. Donald Duke. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining Thank you, us. Thank you, We'll also be joined later on by Uchen Akingbate. She's a managing uh, partner Sinus's PDLP should join us during the course of this conversation. But let me start with you, sir. Um, with this appointment uh, as acting Chief Justice, what is your, your thought on, 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 her, on her swearing in and just her being appointed as acting chief? Well, first of all, you did mention that she is the second um, female to hold the office. Let me remind you and our audience that in the eyes of the law, there is no gender. So um, you don't have, um, there's no pillar to whatever sex you belong to. That aside, what I know of her, 
and reading some of her judgments, she's erudite, she is focused, um, and her colleagues term her brilliant. Her being the acting or CJN, which she will be eventually, is procedural. She's the most senior justice uh, of the Supreme Court. So it's according to seniority, that's how you get it. Not, uh, that's how you become the chief justice, not because uh, you were smart. I, I must say that there are quite a number that have not been smart and ought not to have been judges, let alone Supreme Court judges. But going further, um, there's a smear, and this smear is a judgment of which she was a lead uh, for the Imo State uh, governorship, I think it was 2018 or about 2019. Um, the judgment was seen to be unpalatable, to say the least. And herself and her four other colleagues uh, were barred from going to the United States. Now, going to the United States is not a badge of honor, as far as I'm concerned. But it's a, it's a statement uh, that leaves a sour taste. It's not a decision that I believe the US Embassy or the US uh, Department of State will take lightly. I'm sure they reviewed the, the judgment and found it absurd. And of course, because we lean towards the United States so much when we needed it, they had the temerity, I may say, to express themselves in the way they have. Now, like I did say earlier, it's not a badge of honor to go to the United States or get a visa or not a visa to the United States. But when you think of it, that if there's a UN conference on the judiciary, our chief justice will not be able to attend. Um, the immediate past chief justice, Ariwala, also could not attend. Now, Ariwala's tenure has, you have not asked me this question, but I, I'm, you know, I'm breaking into it, was marred by nepotism of the grander scale. And, and, he tried to justify it as those who were benefits or beneficiaries of his nepotic acts were qualified. That's not the question. There are numerous qualified people, but if you choose a qualification amongst your relatives, that is nepotic. And that does not defeat the high office of chief justice of the Federation. He would go down in history in ignominy. Um, the button has now been transferred to uh, Justice Keke Rick. The onus is on her, and she'll be there for quite a number of years. She'll be there for, for maybe about six years or her about. Um, she, she can redeem herself by cleaning up the judiciary, and in fact, the bar and the bench. The, the judiciary in Nigeria is in a very, very sorry state to say the least. Thank you very much, sir. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the presence here of uh, B.C. Makodrola. She's a legal expert, and she joins us as well. B.C., you're welcome. No, Uchena Uche, Agbade. My apologies. Uchena Agbade is joining us here at King Badi. Thank right. you very much for joining us. Um, so let me come back to you, sir, regarding the reforms that should be made uh, with the new CJN, the Act in CJN. What reforms must be made for her to, like you say, put herself back online um, with, uh, well, uh, a, a proper judiciary? Well, <clears throat> whatever I say here is subjective, but my opinion. <clears throat> if you want this country to continue to exist, there must be justice. Justice is the bedrock upon which human beings exist in any society. So, and in a democratic one, Justice is the pivotal platform upon which it works. So you have a country where justice is not speedily um, meted out. You could be in court for the next 10 years, right? Um, businesses 
foreign businesses always opt for foreign jurisdiction in the case of arbitration um, because they don't have any trust in our justice system. We Nigerians also don't have any trust in our justice system. It's, it's, it's for the highest bidder. I did told an audience not too long ago that lawyers are known to take monies to bribe judges. We know this, let's not behave. You see, when we act naively, we, we, we turn our eyes or behave like the ostrich. We bury our heads and these things are happening. The justice system in Nigeria stinks to high heavens. And you don't want to go to court. Look, I had a, I had a case, an issue with a, with a, with a bank. The bank overcharged me running into the billions. I did a forensic audit, went to the bank, and they said, no, go to court. Because they know that I will, it will take me 20 years to go anywhere. I was smarter than them. I went to the Supreme, I went to the Central Bank. The Central Bank reviewed it and got the bank to repay me the funds. The bank is GTB. Now, this is, a, this is, a, this is what goes on in our financial institutions. How can you talk about foreign investment when you don't have a justice system? How can you talk about peace in your country? If you don't have justice, you will not have peace. So there's a there's a near absence of justice in our in our, in, our, in fact, not near there. There's an absence of justice in our system. And you have people say, "Oh, go to court, go to court," because they know you won't get anything out of it. But I tell you what, the politicians have sorted out themselves. You can go from the tribunal to the Supreme Court in six months. Why can't you do that for everyone? Why do you have to spend months, years, trying to get justice? Why don't, when you go to court, why can't you get justice in 90 days? And if you want to appeal, because an appeal is not on the facts, but it's on the interpretation of the law, based on the facts that have been established at the lower court, why can't you get justice or get your appeal heard in 45 days? Why must every, every case end up in the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court is so loaded today, it will take the Supreme Court, if you stop giving cases to the Supreme Court today, it will take the Supreme Court another 10 years or maybe more to clear all the cases on their desk. What kind of country is this? When we talk of a democracy, which is, and the bedrock of a democracy is the justice system? No. She has a lot of work to do. She has the, the, the onus is on her to prove herself to, to, as the head of the lead or the head justice in this country clean up the system, a judicial reform that would ensure, look, listen, if you ask me, and I said it's subjective at the, at, the, at, the, at the onset, there should be two tiers of appeal systems. You have the high court, the lower court of appeal with three judges, the higher court of appeal with five judges, then it ends there. And you can have, you can go through all this in 180 days. Only cases that have to do with interpretation of the Constitution, cases between states and the federal government, or death sentences, and even all cases that the Supreme Court feels that it is pertinent enough to hear should be admitted to the court. So that when they sit down and write judgments, it is robust, it is well thought through, and it's precedential. Right now, the sort of judgments, because they're just churning out judgments like a conveyor belt, they're like it. They are not worth a precedent that can be that can be referred to in other jurisdictions. We're embarrassing ourselves. I don't know why we're doing this to us. Right. But we should reform the system. And like I said to you, the politicians have sorted out themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's, what is good for the goose is good for the gander. Mr. Duke, and also I'll come to you, Uchena. So we're gonna I'm gonna throw this question to 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 both my extinguished uh, guests here. The extinguished or distinguished? Distinguished. Forgive me. <laughs> forgive me. It's, uh, it's the break for this morning. So, sir, acting Chief Justice uh, of Nigeria, she's been sworn in and she's taken up the mantle. But I need to be educated on this and the process of this. If she's acting Chief jo uh, Judge, what, would, what, would, what are the processes for her to become the Chief Justice of Nigeria? Not acting now. Because I understand she's taken up the mantle, giving uh, Mr. Uh, the Chief Justice Ariwal as a, 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 a resignation or you know leaving the position, uh, passing the age of retirement. What then now happens? What is the process? And I'm going to start with you, Uchenna, here in the studio. All right, let me, let me educate you a bit here. 
it is on the basis of seniority. Yes. So after her tenure, when she attains the age of 70, which is a mandatory retirement age, you retire your birthday. Um, the next most senior justice, according to how you got to the court, not according to your age, but how you got to the court, uh, will take over as chief justice. And it's justice, not judge, right? Um, one thing I find quite amusing was that she was sworn in. She ought not to have been sworn in. She's acting. It's only after the um, Senate has approved or confirmed her appointment that she is then sworn in. So they're you jumping see, we're a so process. Used to doing the wrong so they seem to be doing the wrong thing. They're, they're, they're jumping a process. It seems like they she's been handpicked for the job. Automatically, automatically, she's acting chief judge. You don't swear someone who is acting. Mm, okay. It's when it becomes substantial that you, you swear her in. Now, after she's been confirmed, is she going to be re-sworn again? Yeah. You know, <laughs> we have a problem. Interesting question, right. sir. Really yes. Let's take uh, Uchena's take let's, here let's, uh, on take this Uchena's in the studio. Take, exactly. Uchena, thank you. Yes. Uchena. So just like you said, you have to be sworn in or confirmed by the Senate. That is what authenticates her position. So you saying she's been handpicked for the job, that's not really the case. There's a hierarchy. No, I'm asking, so, do you think she's been handpicked for the job then? You can't be handpicked for the job. You ascend to the job. There's okay. a hierarchy. Okay. So when she reaches her age of retirement or something happens, the next most senior justice in line will take over from her. So there's an ascension. You really can't be handpicked. Mm -hmm. You go, they pick the next most senior judge. So if that line. is the case, yes. then there shouldn't be a situation where she would be the acting CGN. It should just be boom, since you are the next in line and there's a hierarchy being followed, you are the CGN. So well, that's so, so perhaps that's why Judith is asking that very implicative question. Mm. Well, may I clarify? The the, the Constitution, the provisions of the Constitution provide that the CJN is supposed to be confirmed by the Senate. And same thing with ministers and other appointees. Yes, so that is what makes her acting because mm -hmm. it is subject to her clearance and confirmation by the, by the, by the Senate. If they find her wanting and not, if, if there was a process, the process of the confirmation yes. of the Senate, where she comes to the Senate, they would ask her questions and everything else, and they find her wanting and not find her capable for the job, what now happens to her being acting? Uh, well, I guess the next most senior in line, if, if they find her to be lacking, and right? Who would, be, who would be the next most senior? Well, the next most senior, I'm not quite sure what the mm -hmm. hierarchy uh. is, but... I think Mr. Duke had a... He, Mr. Duke, you wanted to um, get an entry in there. What, what, you were about to say something from before. Yeah. Um, as your guest has said, it's, it's the ranking is as you attained <clears throat> or as you got admitted to the Supreme Court, right? Uh, I said that earlier. And it's not based on anything. But basically, what, you, what your, your question here, the point here is, if for any reason she goes, the, so the Senate finds her not fit and proper mm -hmm. to be Chief Justice of the Federation, even on account of her not being able to obtain a visa to the United States or whatever the site is, then she seizes, and from there onwards, she proceeds into retirement. And the most senior, the person immediately who came into the court immediately after her would assume an acting position. Now, the point is here that you don't swear in someone who is acting because she's not been confirmed. You know, you have to get a confirmation before you show, because after the confirmation, are you going to swear in again? Mm. Mm. So you raise concerns about judiciary's independency as well as, you know, the concerns about the clog, how clogged the system, just basically the challenges that she, the, the acting chief just, justice will have to, to tackle. What, what type of political will will she have or need to make sure that the judiciary is autonomous and independent and not captured by the state? Because many critics have said over and over again, with the last, you know, uh, general elections and also other, you know, 
public cases, the public civil cases that were seen uh, in, in, in the media, that the judiciary seemed to be state captured. And let's so forget that she's also from Lagos State as well. You know, how then can she position herself and the judiciary to be very autonomous and, and independent? She's the head of an arm of government. The three arms, she's head of one. She's not only the Chief Justice of the, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, she's the head of the, she presides over the NJC. Everything the book stops at her table, she could initiate a reform in the entire justice system. She could strengthen the disciplinary arm. She's head of the NJC. She could strengthen the, 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 the disciplinary system in, in the courts to ensure that judgments yeah, have reasoning to them. You have a case, you, you have cases in Nigeria where courts of the same um, uh, uh, federal high courts, for instance, give conflicting judgments, ridiculing the justice system in the country. And this has happened under the watch of several past chief justices. It should never be, because each court of power of, 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 same, of same jurisdiction, right? They, they must be a way they communicate. You can't have a court, a high court, for instance, in a way, giving a judgment contrary to what another one gave in, 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 in Port Harcourt. So there's so many things. Besides that, even the, the, the lawyers themselves, they have to be brought to book. But let me share a story with you. What, because each time we talk about the judiciary, we keep on talking about it in the past, not the present. In the past, it was better. I gave, I give an, an example that concerns me, and this story was told to me, and I hope I have the time to tell the story, but very short. It was given, it was told to me by General Abu Salam. In 1998, when I contested as governor, I contested against um, a chap, Mark Uku, He's late now. His elder brother was the closest person to General Abdul Salam. Who told General Abdul Salam that the election in Cross River was flawed? General Abdul Salam called Justice Ephraim Akbata and said to him, the elections in Cross River, I'm told, were flawed. I would like a rerun. Ephraim Akbata looked at him and said, you'll get my letter of resignation by the close of business today. Do you think that will happen today in, 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 in today's Nigeria? There are men of integrity. For you to be a judge, it's something you give your life to. You don't interface any longer with society. For you to rise up to be a justice of the Supreme Court, I mean, you are, you are seen as a rare breed. People look at you with awe. Now they are so they they are, they, they are commonplace. You see justices dancing and spraying at parties. Mm. It's a joke. Mr. Duke, I would like and to you know, extend I the think same we have question. A, a time limit. Yes, yeah, sorry, sir, but I'd like to extend the same question to Uchena here in the studio regarding the complexities of maintaining an independence uh, of, for the judiciary in a politically charged society. So, Uchena, please, if you'd give us your response to that. So, it seems um, she does have her work cut out for her. And I would think that autonomy for the judiciary is not just one way. It's not just one way. It's not just about the political class. Even the entire system and structure of the Supreme Court itself needs to be reworked for that autonomy. Because you start thinking, there's the court, which is the justice system itself, the judiciary. There's the administrative process as well. So there are a lot of things that go into this. And um, restoring autonomy, you must restore public confidence in the judiciary. Different things, what are the things that have brought up controversy about the judiciary? Conflicting judgments, like Mr. Duke has said. Um, you also have nepotism in appointment of judges, like has already been said. So there should be more transparency. He has said she's the head of the NGC, so there should be more transparency in the appointment of judges. And um, yes, when there's more transparency, then things would be a bit better. And um, I think the public opprobrium will be lesser. Hmm. Yes. Okay. And also now speaking on, speaking on the administrative aspect of the court itself, 
The new Supreme Court rules, there are new Supreme Court rules 2024, and this is to replace the Supreme Court rules of 1985, I believe. Yes, and that has made um, substantial improvements on the administrative leg of the court. This has, um, there were practice directions which were obtainable before, but this has incorporated them. And um, you now have situations where you have e-filing, electronic filing, and they are currently working on a Nigerian case management system where the courts and lawyers will have access to that. So if we talk about conflicting judgments, could it be that the judges in Imo did not hear about the judgments in Adamawa? Could it be? Could it be that is a lack of communication? I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult to play that, mm -hmm. but could it be? So when we have this um, new case management system come on board, it can help because you'll be getting these information in real time. And I guess no one will be able to say they did not know that their brother judge had taken this decision mm -hmm. a week or a month ago. So those are things we need to ensure that the system is working right. She will need to ensure that the system is working right. Mm. So when all those things are in place, then um, it will be easier to plug in all these other holes. And really, it comes down to the will of the person. It's difficult. Okay. It's difficult. The mm. challenges will be there. The temptations will be there. But it comes down to our will. And um, in as much as there have been different things, but she has risen and she has done a lot on the back end in terms of ensuring that all these reforms come into play. I mean, I, I have to, uh, one thing I'm certain is that uh, modernize the system, uh, system upgrade, uh, system upgrade yes. mm -hmm. uh, has been touted to be the solution to our infrastructural problems. But we wait to see no, if, it, we'll wait if, to if see. it is. I'd like to come back to Mr. Duke, please, sir. I would like to know if there are constitutional mechanisms in place to help the new Justice Kekere Akun achieve these reforms that we're expecting from her. Are there constitutional lost mechanisms on ground? I can't hear you. We lost you. Said the Can you repeat? I had okay. I'm asking, sir, if there are constitutional mechanisms on ground to aid the new CJN in her reforms that we're expecting her to make in the judiciary. Well, you know, constitutions are made by men. You could institute it if it doesn't exist. It's, you know, the problem with Nigeria is not even so much the uh, system we operate. It's the personnel that operates the system. Yes, there, there are reforms that can be made. Um, judgments, listen to what happened, the local government uh, decision that was taken recently by the Supreme Court. <clears throat> My opinion, that judgment goes flat out against the face of the Constitution. You need to reform, you need to amend the Constitution to really put effect on that judgment because there's what they call the jack, joint uh, account of both you know, joint account with both state and local government. Local governments are not federated units. Local governments are purely administrative units and should be within the purview of the state house of assembly. But now we have elevated it without and given it teeth by the Supreme Court judge without regard for the constitution. So yes, you can amend, you have you, you ought to amend the constitution. For instance, what I said earlier on about having a two-tier appellate system without having to go to the Supreme Court and judgment, have to be given without within 90 days and 45 days more. All that could be done well, under the, uh, with a review of the, of the Constitution. Yes, we ought to. All right. Mm -hmm. and, and Sarah, because we're, we're pressed for time and we have to go very soon, but I, but I have to ask you, the swearing-in happened for the acting Chief jo uh, Justice. The CJN has now been sworn in and she takes up the mantle. But... Do you think that by bypassing the step of, uh, the step of uh, a confirmation by the Senate, do you think that there's something to hide there, uh, especially with her being barred from the U.S.? No, no. I just think that, you know, we don't even know the system we're operating. Like I said, and, I, and your guest also mentioned this, automatically, by sheer seniority, she becomes the next Chief Justice designate, but it's subject to confirmation by the Senate. 
It is upon that confirmation that she is formally sworn in. But we've done it the wrong way, as we usually do. She was sworn in as active. We don't swear in as active, for goodness sake. Right? Because once she is confirmed, are you going to swear her in again? That's the that's point I've been making. Just does, I don't know. And, and, and what kind of message does this pass on to the international community, or especially for the legal community uh, on a world platform, global platform, that the Chief Justice of Nigeria is, uh, Acting Chief Justice of Nigeria is barred and, uh, and also took up the mantle without any confirmation uh, from, uh, you know, the, the executive, or rather, yeah, from the, uh, the executive or legislative, I beg your pardon. From the Senate, <laughs> you're getting me wrong. First of all, a lot of question. Uh, once the chief justice attains the age of 70, he or she proceeds to retirement immediately. The next most senior justice takes over in an acting uh, position and is sworn in after confirmation. Swearing in is formally and now recognized as the Chief Justice of Nigeria prior to you are acting. Now, we have gone around it in an absurd manner and sworn her in without confirmation. She, but she still bears the title acting. The point is, when she is eventually confirmed, you're going to be swearing her in a second time. It doesn't make sense. Regarding yes, does, the sir. point that the, yes, it does, sir. Coming, that the Chief Justice has been barred uh, from obtaining a U.S. visa. All right, sir. It, Unfortunately, no, no, sir, no. Uh, my apologies, sir, but um, we are out of time. But I want to say okay. thank you very much, sir, for joining us and giving us your expert opinion regarding this case here. And of course, also to Uchena, who's in the studio here with us. Thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning here on this topic. Thank you indeed. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's been a great show here for a Sunday. And what a way to round it up. I want to say thank you to all our guests that we've had all weekend up until now. And of course, let me say thank you to my co-host as well, Judith. You're uh, spectacular. I do my uh, best, Joe. A few parts uh, from both sides at the end, but we, <laughs> we enjoyed the show, didn't we? Thank you. Do join us again next week. It's going to be grand from Saturday morning at 8 a.m. But then uh, all the while through the week, perhaps you'll catch glimpses of us inside of the news. I guess you will. Uh, Judith, say your goodbyes. Let's, yes, uh, indeed. It's a goodbye from us right here. Make sure to keep it uh, right here to New Central TV. We go beyond the news to give you the very best of everything, all the conversations and perspective that you need. Coming up at the top of the hour will be uh, the sports and the game. Uh, the gang is ready for you to go. And of course, at the top of the hour at 12 noon will be the news for the noon. But for us, it's goodbye. We'll see you. Bye, everybody. Weekend.